Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the planning subcommittee. My name is Barbara Blake. I'm the chair of this committee and I'm the Seven Sisters Ward Councillor. This feels very echoey. Is everyone on speakers? Is that, that better? Bit OK, so good evening. I'm Barbara Blake, uh, chair of the planning subcommittee. I'm a Seven Sisters Ward councillor. Um, if I can ask the committee to introduce themselves, please, starting on my left. Council Rachel Rice, Council of Tottenham Hill and vice chair of this committee. Matt White, Council for Tottenham Central. Lester Buxton, Council of Crouch End. George Dunstall, Councillor for Stroud Green. Alex Worrell, Councillor for Stroud Green. Nicola Bartlett, Councillor for West Green. Councillor Luke Quarley Harrison, Crouch End. John Bevan, Councillor Northumberland Park. Ejda Ovet, Councillor for Northumberland Park. Thank you. Um, can I ask the officers present to introduce themselves, starting on my left? Justin Farley, Legal Officer. Rob Shostovsky, Assistant Director for Planning, Building Standards and Sustainability. Robbie McNocker, Head of Development Management and Planning Enforcement. Chris Smith, Principal Planning Officer. John Wright Roy, Major Applications Team Leader. Suzanne Kimmon, Climate Change Manager. Richard Truscott, Design Officer. Fiona Ray, Acting Committees Manager. Thank you. And, um, Elizabeth Tatanazzi, Conservation Officer. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, and we do have um, officers in attendance virtually, and they will introduce themselves when relevant. So we're now on to item one, which is filming at meetings. Um, this meeting is being recorded. All registered speakers should be aware that they will be recorded for live or subsequent broadcast via the Council's internet site or by anyone attending the meeting. Item two is the planning uh, protocol. So could members and speakers, uh, you're requested to note the information set out at item two on the agenda. I have apologies for absence from Councillor Yvonne Say. There are no items of urgent business. We're now on to declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of interest? Councillor Bartlett. Um, declaration of interest in uh, item eight as a ward councillor, um, having spoken about the uh, item on the agenda previously. OK, so I. Thank you. And can we just clarify, um, I believe you're intending to leave the room for the duration of our item. Yes, perfect. Thank you. So we have um, item six, which is minutes, which we will consider at the next meeting. And we're now on to item seven, which is uh, the planning applications. Um, and the first one is uh, the Broadwater Farm Estate N17 and Tangmere Willen Road N17 at 6NA. And for the committee, that's pages one, uh, to 232. Um, I won't read out the proposal that's set out in the agen agenda, um, but it's uh, we have two items here. Planning permission, uh, which is a recommendation to grant, uh, and we also have um, the listed building consent um, for the uh, removal of the Grade 2 listed mosaic mural, uh, and that recommendation is to grant as well. So we have two recommendations to grant there and I will hand over to the planning officer Christopher Smith to introduce this application. Thank you.
Okay, thanks for your patience, everyone. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So um, this uh, application or uh, today's committee is uh, looking at two um, applications here. It's uh, for planning permission uh, for the development as shown as your screen, the Blue Water Farm Estate New Homes Scheme, and also listed building consent, um, which is being sought for um, the removal of the and, uh, and replacement of the um, listed mosaic mural. Um, so to summarise the proposed development, it's the uh, the demolition of the existing Tangmere North Alt and Stapleford North buildings, the Enterprise Centre, Medical Centre and Energy Centre buildings. Uh, there's a new development of three to nine storeys in height, 294 new homes at 100% council rent, 35% family sized homes, 10% wheelchair user dwellings, all homes are dual or triple aspect, 91 car parking spaces on site, enterprise and medical facilities re-provided, a new supermarket, new park and civic spaces, improved pedestrian connectivity through the estate, and also the listed building consent uh, for relocation of the listed mural. So a bit of um, development context. Uh, the existing estate is a large residential estate first occupied in the 1970s. Tangmere and North Oak blocks have been poorly constructed and must be demolished. Streets are currently dominated by car parking. There's limited street activity. Pedestrian routes are unclear. The enterprise and health centres are ageing and require refurbishment and um, the uh, estate itself covers the southern part of site allocation SA61. The surrounding area is predominantly residential, it's adjacent to Lordship Recreation Ground and also the amenities of Bruce Grove, Lordship Lane and Phillip Lane which are all nearby. In terms of the listed mural, um, the mural is part of Tangway Block, it was erected following the 1985 riots on the estate, it's located high up and part is partially obscured by later additions to the building. It is not significantly visible around the estate. It's in need of repair. It is, um, it's been listed at grade two um, as of the 5th of October 2022, following a request to Historic England from the artist. And uh, a listed building consent application has been submitted to remove, restore and relocate the mural uh, following the listing. Um, as mentioned, the estate is within site allocation SA61. The site allocation um, is allocated uh, and requires uh, improvements to the housing stock, uh, the general design uh, and routes through the estate. Uh, a master plan is required in collaboration with residents. Uh, it also requires the reprovision of council housing and optimised development on the estate. Uh, so key planning policies covering the site include the Blue Ribbon Network, which is uh, which follows the culverted Moselle River. There's a protective view number 20 uh, through the site, and also um, it has a low uh, public transport accessibility level of 1B to 2. The existing uh, site, uh, the image to the left um, is taken from Willam Road, which shows Tangmere uh, building to the right, the Enterprise Centre to the left, and North Oak Block also on the left beyond the Enterprise Centre. You will note the high levels of car parking in this image. The image to the centre shows Adams Road during the day, which also has a large amount of car parking and little pedestrian activity. And the image to the right shows Gloucester Road, which is the main access point to the estate from the south, demonstrating the scale and height of existing buildings on the estate. Uh, this slide shows existing mural. Um, the image on the left shows the mural from Willam Road at the base of Tangmere. It is located high up on the building and is partially obscured by the entrance hall, which is added more recently. Uh, the image on the right shows a section of the mural at first floor level, which is currently obscured from public view. Um, there have been um, a, a, a long term uh, consultation program occurring. Um, so the resident engagement started in August 2020. There have been a range of consultation events and feedback sessions. Um, the urban design framework master plan responds to feedback from residents, as is required by the site allocation SA61. The quality review panel consider the consultation process to have been exemplary and 85% of el eligible residents that voted um, supported the proposals in a ballot earlier this year. So the new homes, um, there are 494 new homes proposed, 100% of those are for council rent. It's a minimum uplift of 52 homes, a 62.5% increase in the number of family, home, uh, family sized homes on the site. Uh, the new housing is prioritised for existing tenants, leaseholders and freeholders. Uh, the existing estate residents are also prioritised um, and these um, ambitions meet 
the requirements of the Mayor's Estate Regeneration Guidance. In terms of height, scale and massing, the scheme uses three to nine storeys. These, these buildings have similar heights to the existing blocks and are much lower than the North Alt and Kenley blocks, which um, go up to 19 storeys. Um, the tallest building in the new development is in the centre of the estate, and there is low visibility of the new development from surrounding areas. There is no significant impact on the locally significant view corridor number 20, which is from Watermead Way to Alexandra Palace. The microclimate impact of the development is negligible at ground level, and residential amenity is respected. In terms of layout, uh, there's a new route provided through the site on a diagonal northeast to southwest axis. There's new civic squares at each end of the route um, as it goes through the middle of the site. A new community park with water feature. Adams Road and Willem Road uh, would be reinforced as key routes through the site. The undercroft parking below Tangmere uh, would be removed. There would be um, increased street activity and passive surveillance. Um, and the courtyards within the new uh, two of the new buildings would be uh, open during the daytime. So um, high quality new homes are proposed. Uh, the homes have been designed to be light and airy and all of them would be at least dual aspect. All homes would benefit from external private amenity space and internal storage spaces. The buildings would be light, spacious, uh, sorry, the buildings would have light, uh, spacious and accessible lobby areas with distinct design uh, features to um, enable ease of identification by residents. For the non-residential uses, uh, the Enterprise Centre, um, which is um, uh, shown yellow uh, in the image on the left, uh, will be reprovided within new improved units. The Wellbeing Hub, uh, shown uh, red on the same uh, image, provides easy access to an integrated range of services, including retained GP provision. There's a new supermarket, shown in blue, which will be provided on Adams Road. And uh, units, these um, new non-residential units would be located throughout the development to maximise activity on these new streets. Uh, the image on the left here shows the replacement Tangway building from Gloucester Road with a new row of terrace houses in the foreground, that's with the red brick. The end terrace property fronts onto Gloucester Road to ensure passive surveillance onto this street. Uh, the image to the right shows the publicly accessible internal courtyard within the new Tangway building. Uh, this image shows the new improved Willem Road looking west from the south of the replacement North Alt building. It shows a pedestrian friendly street with tree planting, reduced car parking and passive surveillance from the new Enterprise Centre and Wellbeing Hub units. Uh, this image here shows um, a view looking west along Adams Road from the south of the former school site. It shows the location of the new supermarket and the improved public realm with tree planting as part of the proposals to highlight this street as a key east-west route through the estate to Lordship Wreck. This image provides a view along the new diagonal link from the northeast. It shows the large tree planted open space at the heart of the estate, the two new civic squares at the northern and southern ends of this new link, and the activity provided by the new enterprise units and play equipment. This image shows a panorama of the new community park, which includes a range of tree planting and a water feature. This space has been designed for use by a range of people throughout the day to maximise its use, including play equipment for younger children and benches for adults. In terms of landscaping and public realm, uh, there's a uh, legible street network designed for pedestrian uh, use. Um, under the underused memorial gardens will be re relocated to the community park in the centre of the site. There's an improved environment for gathering and public life. Um, the new streets will connect the estate to Lordship Recreation Ground through tree and other planting. There's new native tree planting provided on the new streets. A maximum of 41 trees will be removed, none of which um, are identified as Category A, and a net increase of at least 200 trees. Uh, sustainable drainage measures will be provided. There's a 100% um, or greater than 100% increase in biodiversity net gain on the site. The urban greening factor would be a minimum of at least um, 0.4 and the woodland area to the south will be protected. Uh, the mural uh, relocation proposals uh, involve the careful dismantling and removal of the mural from Tangmere, uh, interim storage, restoration of the mural, and then relocation nearby. Uh, the current proposals uh, show that the uh, mural could be relocated on the Hawkins block. And these proposals are supported by Historic England and the Conservation Officer. The application is supported by an urban design framework, 
Site allocation SA61 requires a community-led master plan and the urban design framework is considered to meet this requirement. It shows a long-term vision for the potential future development of the estate. There are details provided of smaller scale interventions to the public realm. And these build on the quality, uh, quality principles set in the uh, main part of the planning application. Uh, there's improved connectivity to and integration with the wider area, which is a key, key objective of the uh, UDF. And the proposed development is compatible with this wider estate vision. So in terms of the principle of the development, the, uh, it, the development proposes the demolition of Tangmere and Northolt buildings, uh, which, are, is, which is required due to their poor structural condition. The residential development re-providing council homes and floor space is supported by the London Plan and the Mayor's Good Practice Guide for Estate Regeneration. It meets other requirements of the Mayor's Good Practice Guide for Estate Regeneration as well, including public consultation on the proposals, a right of return for eligible residents and a right of return for leaseholders. Non-residential uses would be re-provided in modernised facilities. It's supported by the Urban Design uh, Framework Master Plan and therefore it's in accordance with the requirements of Site Allocation SA61. There are 294 new homes uh, provided, which would be uh, provided as 100% council rent housing. There are a significant increase in three and four bedroom homes as well. In terms of quality design, the quality review panel have commented that design teams extensive community engagement and the integration of the community's aspirations into the proposals are noted. And also uh, they support the scale and massing of the proposals and find much to admire in the architecture. There's strong support from the council's design officer and the Metropolitan Police Designing Out Crime Officer also supports the proposal. In terms of the residential quality, the, the, the development meets all London Plan internal and amenity space standards. All homes would be dual or triple aspect. There's secure access calls with high quality design and layout, 10% wheelchair accessible homes. The wheelchair homes would be accessible by two lifts and all buildings would be fitted with sprinklers. In terms of residential amenity, there's no significant impact on the amenity of ne nearby residents. Moving on to the public realm, there are significant improvements to the urban environment in terms of its appearance, layout and safety. The memorial garden will be integrated into a new community park. There's a significant increase in soft landscaping and tree planting, an urban greening factor of no more than, oh, sorry, of more than 0 0.4, which is London plan require, um, compliant, and um, an over 100% increase in biodiversity net gain. In terms of the heritage impact, the mural attached to Tangmere is listed at grade two and has been since October 22. Uh, the mural must be removed and relocated as Tangmere is to be demolished. The heritage significance and special architectural and historic interest of the mural has been taken into account in the context of the proposal. Paragraph 11 of the MPPF states that developments that accord with the development plan should be approved. Though the development would result in the relocation of a heritage asset, it would still conserve its significance and its special historic and architectural interest and would also provide a significant uh, would also provide significant additional benefits in terms of replacing replacing buildings that must be demolished, a significant amount of new council housing, renewal of the estate in accordance with site allocation SA61, an increase in open space and, and biodiversity, and new construction and end user jobs. As such, it is considered that although a low level of harm to the designated heritage asset would occur, on balance, the development would still accord with the council's development plan. In terms of sustainability, there's a minimum of 65.8% carbon reduction uh, and a new energy centre. High levels of insulation provided throughout the development, light and airy homes, which would minimise energy demand. And there's a future connection to the district heating network expected. In terms of parking, 91 car parking spaces to propose, which is 0.3 per new home. There's a net reduction in parking on site. Additional parking would be available in the wider estate if there's demand. Uh, the parking controls on the estate uh, are to be reinstated in the near future and uh, hi there's high quality cycle parking including dedicated spaces within the new homes. Just to touch um, on the Mosul River as well, policy DM28 requires new development to restore or enhance watercourses. The culverted Mo uh, River Moselle is too close to existing buildings to be fully naturalised. The deculverting would increase public, self public safety and health, health risks on the estate and the diagonal link and community park provision would be compromised. The Environment Agency support retaining the river in the culvert as it currently is, and therefore, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, other options have been explored for potential deculverting, including on Brookside as part of the urban design framework. 
There are a range of planning obligations which would, which would be secured, including uh, 294 homes for council rent, affordable workspace, walking and cycling improvements totaling £100,000, a road junction accident reduction strategy uh, totaling £150,000, travel plan monitoring of £10,000, um, CPZ reinstatement contributions of £30,000, a carbon offsetting contribution if there is no connection to district heating network in the future, uh, employment and skills initiatives and other contributions as necessary totaling a minimum of £290,000. Therefore, officers recommend the committee resolves to grant planning permission subject to conditions and planning obligations as set out in the committee report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so questions from the committee. So Councillor Buxton. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, in um, light of uh, recent uh, um, recent news and you know I'm sure fellow councillors will uh, share that we have had a significant increase of casework with, with regards to mould and damp. Um, so I, in terms of the new development, uh, what considerations are taken to prevent mould and damp in uh, the, the new flats? I think there was, a, there was a slide in the presentation about the new homes being light and airy, dual aspect at a minimum. Um, that would maximise the amount of natural ventilation into the units, which would which would help uh, with with mould and damp. They're new build properties as well, so be it the you know the best quality construction as well. Councillor Rice. Yeah, can I ask about the mural, please? What, what advice did you receive from Historic England about the mural? Why is it being removed? Why can it not be? Stay, why can it not stay in place where it, it currently is and, and, and build around it? And where is it going to be stored? Uh, this sounds to me like something you put away in a cupboard somewhere and forget about it for the next 20 years. So could you not put a limit on the storage time? And just a, just a brief word about the parking. It, there's no suggestion, I hope, that this is a car free zone. But I see there's a quite a lot of money to do with a CPZ. Is it has it not got a CPZ right in the water farm? Uh, what's the CPZ funding? What's that going to purchase? The 30,000 pounds for CPZ provision. What's that going to buy? Thank you. Uh, so yes, the the mural, the uh, Tangmere building uh, is required to be demolished because of its structural condition. Um, so that's the reason why the mural cannot be retained in situ. The, the building has to be demolished and so that the mural needs to be removed at least temporarily um, in, in the short term. Uh, it would be stored uh, in uh, while a restoration plan is being developed. Um, I certainly hope that wouldn't be um, for an extended period of time, but uh, there are conditions that uh, cover a strategy for the the, uh, the restoration of the mural, which includes storage. Um, so, you know, a, a conservation officer in Historic England are going to keep a very close eye on those conditions they reference and the conditions, and they've recommended them as well. So, um, you know, uh, I, I don't think that the mural will be kept uh, for an extended period of time in a in a in a storage container or anything like that. Um, on the on the final point about the CPZ, um, my understanding is that there has been a a CPZ on the site, but it's 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 either lap, lapsed or not not fully enforced, and that um, the CPZ the ambition is for the CPZ to be re uh, sort of restarted on the estate, but the a consultation process will follow um, to to enable residents to engage with that process, so that the money is for um, work relating to that. Councillor, if I may just add to that, <clears throat> um, the the, the um, issue of the mural has been looked at by um, Stark England and our own conservation expert, Elisabetta, and found that um, removing it and restoring it and putting it in a more visible location provides a heritage benefit. So um, that has, has been a consideration that, that we've um, given weight to, that, that this would actually enhance that heritage asset. Um, there were reasons it couldn't be retained in situ and built around um, because of feasibility and that this option um, it is in many ways better than, than, than that option. 
Thank you, Councillor White. Thanks, Chair. Just just uh, following up on the point about dump and mould made by Councillor Buxton. Thanks. Um, um, so my, my understanding is that um, a lot of the time uh, damp is, is, is caused by uh, people being forced to dry their clothes in their living space. And, and I'm just wondering what thought has been given or what thought might be given in future in in um, in council development. So maybe this is not a question for planning officers, but maybe for, 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 the, for the housing delivery team uh, about providing spaces where people can dry their clothes. I know I had a conversation with my brother who lives in a former council block and he was he was saying that in some blocks previously these seem to have fallen out of use but there there used to be communal drying spaces in 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 areas that had good flow of air in in in, in the in, in the block and that maybe some thought should be given to that because you know i mean i know from my own personal experience that drying is drying clothes in your living room it it, it doesn't leave lead to a very um pleasant living environment so maybe, maybe that's something we can think about Chair, if I may, um, it's pretty worth bringing in um, Suzanne, our, our climate change officer, just to um, talk about the principles of, of positive ventilation. And I think um, perhaps if we hold some of that question for the applicant team, th th there are um, drying rooms um, in this state at the moment, and I, I think there have been issues and, and problems with those. Um, I think most are closed now, um, so that's probably something that, that they wouldn't want to, to build in. But um, just over to Suzanne quickly on, on passive ventilation. Thanks for your question. Um, <clears throat> they were the flats will also include mechanical ventilation, which uh, should help with decreasing in humidity inside the the flats. Um, but there is also, of course, external amenity space in which uh, that people can use to dry their clothes. Um, that, that would be my simple answer. If that's okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dunstall. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, just on, on parking again, um, it's obviously a significant reduction in the in the parking spaces down to 90, 91. Um, <clears throat> and I see that the stress survey says that there is a lot of extra capacity around the wider estate, but it doesn't give me any indication of what that kind of looks like. And obviously you cited right at the beginning that it, and I you know, I know the area. It's it, you cited that access to public transport is not great in terms of TfL's um, mechanism of measuring that. Um, so yeah, any detail on more detail on the stress thing for uh, for the parking. Um, Chair, if I may come in there. Um, so, Councillor, in, in response to that, um, as part of our um, consultation this we did a larger piece in terms of the total number of spaces on the estate and I think uh, looking at the total numbers in terms of the wider space and with the additional units I think we did a calculation that 93 percent of the units in total across the estate including new ones would have access to our car parking space so in terms of the wider area a parking survey was done for the entire estate and using that kind of um uh, space per unit, there is sufficient space on the estate to cater for this development and the existing units. Thank you, uh, Councillor Worrell. Thank you. Um, some of these may be more for the applicant team, so let, let me know if that's the case with any of these points. Um, just going back to the um, planning application history of the site, um, just the there's a reference to the request for an environmental impact assessment and then that not being required. Could you just kind of explain why that was? Um, <clears throat> on the housing mix, um, I know that the proportion of one bed is um, somewhat kind of exaggerated when compared to our social housing need, even though that kind of fits into a broader context of lots of different mixed sizes on the wider estate. Um, I just wondered what the justification was for that within this area that is being developed for the quite high number of one bed. Um, and then on the parking as well, um, I know that the GLA's response was that there was too much parking 
and that this should be reduced. Um, and again, I realised that we're starting from a place of really a lot of parking. And I'm wondering, is it just that it would be really quite a dramatic reduction to take it down to a more kind of environmentally desirable level? And it, you know, it's kind of more of a needs to be more of a gradual process and what the reasoning is behind that. And then finally, I know that um, in, I think it's appendix, one of the appendixes, appendices, um, <laughs> the health and safety executive have some outstanding concerns, particularly around um, there being a, I think it's a single exit fire sta uh, staircase, and those concerns haven't been addressed yet to their satisfaction. And I'm just wondering what the sort of proposed way forward on that is and whether they'll be, is there a possibility they'll be left unaddressed or? Yeah, thank you. Um, just to touch quickly on the um, the EIA side of things, there was a, a scoping request um, undertaken uh, where the council looks at whether a, um, a environmental impact environmental impact assessment is required as part of this development. We consulted various environmental bodies, um, including Natural England, Environment Agency, um, and also sort of local knowledge of the site. And um, given it's it's quite a, an urban, a dense urban area as it was, it was deemed that, um, you know, a development like this is, is fairly consistent with an urban area so that an environmental statement isn't required as part of this application. Um, on the, the, the HSE side of things, um, yes, we we know that they they have a, a some relatively minor issues we think with the scheme. Um, uh, we've consulted our building control um, department who who feel that the scheme is is suitable um, to to go forward at planning stage and have those matters addressed potentially at, at building control stage. Um, if it gets to um, uh, a, what we've got, we've got conditions as well that require fire statements etc to be submitted to the council. Um, and uh, you know the GLA will also review this at, at stage two before a decision is issued. If there are any points raised at those stages, then there's there's those extra layers of um, of assessment before the development is built. So you know there will be an opportunity for further changes if if that's required. Thank you, Chair. And just to add to that and confirm what um, Chris Smith has said about um, building control. Um, so, yeah, um, it's understood that this can be resolved at a later stage. Um, and just to clarify, there's not a requirement um, in terms of single or double staircase. Um, the requirement is about having detailed fire engineering analysis, which doesn't necessarily mean that you need two staircases. A single staircase can uh, be proved to be perfectly safe and adequate as long as there is detailed fire engineering analysis. So it's not sort of clear cut in that respect. So um, the head of building control has confirmed that um, uh, that is uh, capable um, in a future stage. So there's no concern from building control on that element. Thank you. So is it too Sorry, much parking uh, for bringing Maurice? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah short chair. Um, thanks for that. Um, so on, on the too, too many parking spaces, councillor, I think this is a balance we need to reach. So if you look at what's being reprovided in terms of the new units, that's, uh, that's about 0.3% per unit. But you have to consider this as part of a larger estate and it's very difficult to actually separate what are our tenants exist in parking rights in terms of removing those parking because a lot of this um, estate is not actually subjected to this planning application. So overall it's a reduction and it's a reduction in what is currently there uh, but I don't think it's possible for us to reduce it below that and um, the reason being is that if we were to provide less parking for this new element of the development proposal it wouldn't stop them from actually parking in the wider estate because there's not a control that we currently have or we could implement that exclude them from applying for the parking permit as part of the estate scheme just to just to touch on the housing mix as well um i mean i yeah, I see your point about the 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 sort of the, um, the housing strategy and what we're what we're looking to achieve here. Uh, we are able to apply those policies flexibly if there's over 75% affordable housing. 
Um, there's also a significant increase on family homes on the on the estate. There's an additional 40, 62.5% increase in, in three and four bed homes. So, you know, we felt on, on balance that was a significant enough positive to um, to overcome that. OK, right. So no more questions. Councillor Bevan. Well, first, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the team on the fact that all the units are a dual aspect, at least. We never get that from private developers, so something for us to bear in mind. The council can do it, but others can't seem to do it, so that's really good. But then I want to raise a concern that happened on Rosa Luxemburg Court, where the entrance lobbies were an absolute disaster, which I've raised before. And I want an assurance that the entrance lobbies to these blocks will be really attractive and make tenants proud to live there rather than walking in it and looking at, oh, what does this look like? Because Rosa Luxemburg is a disaster. And then designing out crime, can you give me some idea of what grade you'll be seeking? Because there's various grades, gold, silver, one, two, et cetera, et cetera. And then the lift, you said the nine story block had two lifts. Can you clarify that a bit? That's nothing to do with the re new fire requirements from Grenfell. If it's got two lifts, has it got a stairwell as well? Or because I'm because I know we're the only country in the world that allows one exit on tower blocks. All the other countries, well, there's two countries in the world that only allow that, and we're one. All the other countries have two means of exit. So if there's two lift shafts, are there any stairs or? Or what? And on the on the interest lobbies, um, they will be high quality. They have a very high quality design, very spacious, very airy. Um, you know, I think the the uh, the architects have shown a real intent to um you know make sure there's the highest possible quality for every block uh you know we will we've got conditions um uh relating to materials that will, will make sure that their you know those materials are, are, very, are very good um clear they're they're in they're internal so it's a slightly different um uh sort of a point to consider but i think yeah i mean they, they've shown every intent so far that they they wanted to make those um those lobbies as as high quality as possible they need to be attractive to the residents when they approach the lobby. It looks attractive, attractive and it welcomes them in, not looking like a doctor's operating theatre. Yeah, the, the images that, that I've seen um, in the in the in the scheme and the, the, the plan submitted with the application show that they'll be light and airy, um, you know, with very, very good quality materials. So we'll be securing that through um, the materials condition. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just on the issue of the staircases, so there's not a requirement to have two staircases. It's not a requirement. And um, the requirement is to have detailed building, fire safety, engineering analysis. Um, and this is subject to there's, there's lots of extra checks and balances now since Grenfell. New legislation and policy has has come in and is in effect for schemes like this. Um, so we have building safety gateway one, which is the planning stage. There'll be a gateway two in the future for building control. Um, and over the summer, there was a circular published by the government um, look, explaining exactly what I've talked about, the, the detailed building fire safety engineering analysis. So that work will need to be done. Uh, and that um, does not necessarily need to conclude that two staircases are needed. And that is the expectation that two staircases are not needed um, as part of this. And the building control will review that um, at that stage as well to confirm that's the case. Mike, so if there's two lifts and the electric goes and there's no staircase, can, can you clarify that? Um, there is a staircase. I mean, there will be so many other checks and balances um, in terms of compartmentation, um, the materials used, um, that that is deemed safe and that is what is considered in the fire safety engineering analysis. So there are there are many, many other um, checks and balances that are new checks and balances that didn't exist some years ago um, that do exist now. So. Um, Right now, tall buildings like this, um, and this isn't the tallest building, um, get more thorough checking and detailed stages of checking than than at any stage before. There's there's a whole um, a series of checks before the building can progress at any stage, so that the appropriate time the checks can be made. 
Um, and I just wanted to just cover on the entrance lobbies as well. Um, so obviously that's that's really important, you know, the experience of residents and the design on that. Um, I'm aware that the the wider urban design framework for the, the master plan and the area does consider entrances and the resident experience of entrances. And I understand that's been considered by the quality review panel as well. You know, it, the design and the quality of the development is not just about what it looks like on the outside, but it's the overall experience. So that is something that has been um, considered um, in some detail. Um, I don't know if, uh, Chair, if, if it's possible to bring Richard Truscott, our urban design officer in, who's looked at this issue um, a little bit as well. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, yeah, the, the, the architects have, des uh, have designed the entrances um, with good quality, robust materials like brick and uh, ceramic tiles and things. And um, I mean, Councillor Bevan, you probably remember our visit to the King Square estate in Hackney, which is by the same architects. I think they had very exemplary robust but very pleasant attractive entrances and these are very similar if not better um, they also have large glazed windows you know so they're very visible from the street uh, but you know with uh, secure locks and you know the double um double entrance so that the, the, you, you you can't get the date uh, the um people sneaking in after someone who's, who's used the um who's used their fob to get in What's it called? Tailgating. That's what it's called. Isn't it? um, so yes, so I think uh, the, the, the entrances are very well designed and they're very visible, you know, prominent locations on the streets. And the design in the outside? Yeah, sure. I can um, just touch on that. Um, I mean, my understanding is for residential developments, they have to secure uh, at least silver. So, uh, you know, uh, through the, the Met Police, we'll be expecting that, that that's achieved. Can I, perhaps when the applicants speak, can you say something about designing out crime as well? Um, uh, and um, I'm sure the architects and the council will note your comments on dual aspect, Councillor Bevan. Thank you. So Councillor Corley Harrison, and then I do want to move on. Thanks, Chair. Just a question on um, the walking and cycling contribution, which is um, £100,000. Um, I couldn't... Could you perhaps explain what it's going towards? Because from reading through the pack, it looks like it's come from a recommendation from the transport officer, but that was for a much more significant amount of money than what is being given. And it appears to just be for some design work, consultation work. So what's that £100,000 exactly going on? Uh, Chair, if I may. Uh, so the contribution has been sought is to link the site with CS1 and also to link it to Lordship Rec, uh, which will link uh, the site to the wider kind of Lordship Lane up to Wood Green. Um, so the idea is that we will do all the design feasibility and look towards sell and other funds to, to implement a route extension into the site. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So if we can move on to the objectors, I think we have Jacob Seca here. Um, I'll wait till you sit down. <laughs> okay, Mr. Sek. So um, we there were going to be two of you. And we so, but we'll give you six minutes um, to um, address the committee if you want to start now. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Yeah, I'm just going to cover three points, uh, beginning with the health centre. Um, we are point one of our objection is the health centre uh, and the, the fact that uh, you want to demolish the health centre. As a point of information, uh, we heard in the presentation that the health centre is old and needs refurbishment. It was built in 1996, not that long ago. I've never heard until this evening anyone saying it needs refurbishment. I've been there, I've been in all the rooms, I've looked around, I've talked to the staff who work there. Nobody's ever said it needs refurbishment until now. So I don't know where that's coming from. Um, but more importantly, uh, knocking down the health centre breaches site allocation 61. The, it breaches your own policy. Um, that's site allocation 61 of the site allocations development plan document of 2017. Uh, as quoted in paragraph 4.14 of the planning statement, um, 
development on this site must match the capacity of existing community facilities, i.e. whatever community facilities you put in must match what you've demolished. And what you're pr proposing to put in in terms of healthcare does not match it. The new so-called wellbeing hub would only have a capacity of 266 square metres. The current health centre has a capacity has a capacity of, sorry, um, the current health centre has a capacity of 370 uh, square metres. So you're going down by quite a considerable amount. Um, also, we've got at the moment, we've got four um, consulting rooms and a midwife's room, and you're actually going down to one consulting room. We were misled in the ballot about this. On page 20 of the Landlord Offer, you said that we would have a modern health centre with a modern examination rooms, plural, exam, modern examination rooms. Now, on page 12 of Appendix 2, which shows plans and images, it shows a wellbeing hub with only one consulting room, singular. So the promise in the ballot that we would have consulting rooms has been broken. We've now apparently got one consulting room. OK, and that's, you know, so we've gone down, we'll be going down from four consulting room, rooms and a midwife's room to one consulting room. That is not matching existing community facilities. Therefore, you are in breach of your own policy and you cannot breach your own policy to that extent. It's just not possible. Um, the second point of issue is family sized housing. The proposed development provides only 35 percent three and four bedroom homes. As stated on uh, paragraph 6.66 of the report for consideration, Haringey's housing strategy states there should be 55% three and four bedroom homes. So that's a huge drop from 55% to 35%. Um, what's worse is the planning statement in April, which went up to the GLA, was misleading because paragraph 5.31 claims that the number of three and four bedroom units was reduced to 35% due to local housing need, i.e. Apparently on Broadwater Farm, we don't need that many three and four uh, bed housing units. Yes, we do. Um, and in fact, you've confirmed this yourselves because the Residents Association was told at a meeting on the 21st of se September 2021 with the architects and the head of regeneration um, that the proposed number of three beds would meet only 60% of the needs for three beds in the area on the estate and the number of four beds would only meet 90%. Well, do the arithmetic. Obviously, Housing need indicates you need more three beds, especially, and, and more four beds. So we were told the real reason for having less three beds and four beds and loads of one beds was cost, because it's cheaper to build one bedroom bedroom flats. That wasn't what you said in your planning statement. It, you really cannot put misleading stuff like that in your planning statements. I'm sorry. Um, so really, this needs to go back, and you, you need to look at the actual level of housing need on the estate, which is not reflected in what you're providing in terms of the housing mix. Um, this is a very serious matter. Overcrowding is an awful problem on Broadwater Farm. OK, and just it's very cavalier just to build loads of one beds because you think this is cheaper and, you know, at least it's a bit of an increase. And you can't do that. I'm sorry. Uh, this is a really serious problem that has to be taken seriously and not putting in misleading statements. Um, parking paragraph 6.17. Now, as you're saying, you want to bring in a, a CPZ on the estate. Again, it's misleading, as I've seen in a document from your solicitors, to say that, that residents all discussed this uh, CPZ we did, during the ballot. During the ballot, what was talked about was parking restrictions, which we all took to mean an estate parking scheme, which is free, a CPZ you have to pay for. If people had known for definite they were going to have to pay for parking, you would have got a much bigger no vote, believe me because it's a very live issue. We actually had a petition in 2017 against the CPZ on our estate, and after that, the CPZ lapsed. That's why the CPZ was, was, was withdrawn, because we had a petition against it. It was due to popular demand from, from the residents. They didn't want a CPZ. They wanted an estate parking scheme, which is free, but not a CPZ. So this is really a betrayal of, ballot promise of what you said in the ballot. You never said this in the ballot. OK, you're obviously planning this from the start, but you never said it in the ballot and you shouldn't conduct ballots like that. You should be absolutely be, be absolutely above board and honest about what the offer is. Um, now. Two final point, I know what you're saying, you're thinking, well, if we don't pass this now, it's going to lead to huge delays. If we did put in more three bedrooms, we'd have to delay the scheme. Not really, because if you look at how schemes are done, like Woodbury Down, for example, big, you know, is that. 
the housing mix changes. You start off with, they started off with one housing mix, and as time changed, they, they did change it in the later development. So you could start with what you're doing at the moment in terms of this housing development, which everybody wants, and then you could introduce three and four bedroom houses by changing the later plans. So there's no need for any delay, okay, uh, if, the, if this planning um, application is rejected. You don't need to, to, to delay any, anything, really, because you can do it in a sort of smart manner. Okay, thank uh, you, Mr. Zaki. You've the six minutes is up now. OK, that's, thank that's you. more or less it's anyway. Thank you. That's more or less it. OK, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so do committee members have any questions? Uh, Councillor Bevan. Yeah, uh, the wellbeing centre. Uh, that's in my mind is not a doctor's surgery because a single practice doctor's surgery would not be acceptable these days anywhere. So the wellbeing centre, I think, is slightly different than that. Have, are you aware of that difference or can the officers explain exactly what that centre is going to do? Um, I'm not sure what a uh, single practice centre because the Broadwater Farm Health Centre is run by the Lawrence Road Surgery, Lawrence House Surgery, sorry, sorry. So they've got more than one, they, they've got other doctors available. They just don't send them to Broadwater Farm. Um, our health needs are, are sorely neglected. And um, as 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 we stated in the original objection, it um, brought to farm has rather special health needs and rather rather difficult and complicated health needs. And and sort of running down our health services like this is a scandal, really. I mean, this is this is literally a life and death issue. It shouldn't be happening. Um, so we need proper healthcare provision, not one consulting room um, in a. Um, uh, in in this wellbeing hub that's going to be devoted to sort of offices for bureaucrats and things like that uh, that's completely unacceptable and it's a breach of policy and i would suggest it's unlawful um can i ask an officer to come in about the um health center please thank you chair um just on the point of policy um the site allocation guidelines um which are set out in 6.18 um talk about capacity so that's um, about being able to deliver services, not necessarily floor space. Um, and at 6.46, it talks about um, the needs of the local community. So this is an issue that um, there has been significant engagement on um, from the applicant, which I'm sure they can tell you about um, at, at, the, um, at the correct point. Um, but the, the um, CC, um, CCG, um, which have, have subsequently changed their name, um, have been consulted on this. and. Um, are are in strong support of this, so that there's a clear um, steer from the NHS that this is acceptable for for meeting local needs for healthcare provision. Councillor Rice, um, thank you, uh, Councillor Rice. Can I just get some further clarification from the transport officer, Inspector of this CPZ? What the officers, not the transport officer, said this, but what the other officer said when he replied to my question, he he indicated that the CPZ had fallen into misuse. But but uh, the question from the local resident, he the local resident who just spoke, he he seemed to think it's fallen into disuse um, because there was a, uh, a vote against it. Uh, I'm not sure about all that because. I, I don't think you can vote against the CPZ that's in, in, in situ anywhere. So, is Mr. What's his name there? It's, it's, it's Chair, if, if I may. Sorry. So, there's. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, Chair, Maurice, thank you. Yeah, if I may, there's two elements to the Broadwater Farm, and it's very confusing. I, I'll, I'll admit. So there, are, there are adopted roads within the Broadwater Farm estate, which are public highways, where we'll need a parking scheme on those roads, and then there, there are roads that belong to housing, we'll ha which have its own housing parking scheme. So there's two elements to the proposals. Okay, thank you. Um, can I bring, I want to bring Robbie McNocker in about this reduction of the three and four bedroom units. Thank you, Chair. I think the, the important um, point on, on the housing provision is that the site allocation has requirements to engage with existing residents and, and to meet that housing need. Um, so that um, this is a case where um, homes are being demolished and, and replaced. So. Um, it, it's not as simple as, as where um, it's a new build and, and you'd be looking for our normal housing strategy mix. Um, this has to re-provide for existing residents and, and there's obligations through the site allocation that, that have to be met. So in this case, 
um, it is increasing the, the number of family units significantly and um, that's part of that wider picture of, of providing for residents needs and um, changing that mix to address overcrowding on the estate. Okay, Councillor Bob. Yeah, just to clarify, sorry. Uh, so it's questions for Mr. Secker. Uh, what well, was just clarity on Robbie's point on the, uh, but uh, do you have exact figures of what the uh, the current makeup of Broadwater Farm is in terms of units and so just so we can see. I mean, I do have some figures for the application site, the wider estate I don't have to hand. Um, I mean, the application site, um, the it's showing also, oh, maybe that is the estate. I think it's the site anyway. Um, it's 72, sorry, 70 percent one bedroom units, 3 um, percent two bedroom units, 25 percent three bedroom units and, and 1 percent four bedroom units. So we're going from those family housing um, um, units, we're going from 1 percent four beds to 15 percent. Um, and uh, there's a, a slight reduction in the three beds from 61 to 60. Uh, which is 25.2 percent to, to 20 percent uh, but that is but that is more than made up for by um, the significant increase in much larger family sized um, accommodation okay right thank you so thank you mr second very much um and i'm going to come to the applicant now thank you Um, so, um, the applicant supporters, David Sherrington from Haringey, thank you. Um, you have six minutes, but can you also pick up about the drying facilities and the, um, the designing out crime? So, I might have to allow you a few extra seconds, but let's see how you get on. Thank you. OK, so thank you, Chair. So I've got some colleagues and stakeholders with me who are going to speak as well. And thank you also to Jacob for his um, comments. And we provided a comprehensive response to those comments in the planning application that can be found in the pack, but happy to take further questions on that. I won't go into detail about the scheme because you've obviously read about it and heard from Chris, but I do want to emphasise the central role that residents have played in the development of this design work so far. There's a community design statement in the pack that shows all the work that KCA did with our team to take residents through this um, design process, and they will continue to be part of a co-design process going forward uh, through our new co-design framework that we've just launched. Um, it's worth contextualising that this scheme is part of a much wider regeneration scheme across the whole estate. So if you look at the model, you can see the new development that goes through the middle. Uh, everything outside of that is going to be subject to comprehensive um, refurbishment. There'll be work uh, at the ground floor as part of the urban design framework to better link the estate to the surrounding area. And with that will come um, opportunities around jobs, skills and training. So it's a much broader picture that we're part of. And overall, we'll be investing near enough 250 million pounds in this estate over the next five to six years. And we'll bring more proposals through to planning committee um, next year as part of the refurbishment scheme. Um, the, the work that we've been doing here has been five years in the making, and it's fantastic to be sitting here um, presenting it um, to you today. Um, I wanted to hand over um, to my colleague Maureen, and maybe I can um, pick up the drying facilities and the security uh, once the other supporters have spoken. So I'll hand over to Maureen, who's uh, one of the head teachers at one of our outstanding schools on the estate, the Brook. 
Um, so I'm one of the head teachers at the Broadwater Inclusive Learning Community, and that consists of a mainstream primary school, the Willow, and a special primary school, the Brook. And I'm speaking tonight on behalf of both head teachers and also on behalf of those many residents whose children come to our schools and those who are members of our respective staff bodies. We are all totally supportive of this scheme as we believe that it will be of immense significance to the estate, which has lived with the reputation for so many years that is undeserved and not truly representative of the community it serves. I was privileged to be on the design group for this project, which discussed the future vision for the estate and our regular meetings and those with the wider community gave every stakeholder the opportunity to put forward a viewpoint and share innovative and practical ideas so that the project regeneration could address some of the problems that residents faced whilst being realistic about the economic prerogatives. It's no secret that there are many families presently living in overcrowded conditions on the estate, with 294 new homes proposed and a significant proportion of these having three and four bedrooms. I believe the scheme will resolve that issue. And there can be no doubt that another positive outcome of the regeneration will be that residents will feel much safer as the pavements and streets will be opened up and there will be more play and leisure space, which will give young people a sense of belonging. To conclude, the ambience of the estate would improve enormously through this project by offering, in addition to housing, small business workplaces, a new wellbeing centre, a new shop, and also will improve the wellbeing and life chances of residents by engendering a jobs training and skills programme. It's an ambitious and forward thinking project and tells the world that the residents on Broadwater Farm Estate are part of a vibrant and inclusive community who are greatly valued. I wholeheartedly endorse the scheme and look forward to watching the estate's transformation. Thank you, Maureen. And I'd just like to introduce Councillor Gordon. Thank you. Um, well, I think the reason that I wanted to come along tonight to speak to this application is because I think this is a watershed moment for the Broadwater Farm. Um, this has been a long time to get us to this stage and um, I was really pleased to see the comments that the way in which we brought the residents with us along this journey has been an exemplar in terms of our consultation and engagement process. And, um, you know, to have a scheme that is 100% council homes and building 294 homes it means that we took a position where we had the shock of the health and safety issues over north holt and tangmere when we took that position and turned that shock situation into a massive opportunity to really rejuvenate this estate and to turn it into um, what will be um, a tremendous estate to, to live on as Maureen is so adequately you know outlined just now I think that is why we had the result in the ballot that we did of 85 percent of um of that ballot for um for approving of the rent the regeneration scheme the quality of the homes is extraordinarily high with spacious homes with um like you said as mentioned before, dual and triple aspect with balconies. Every home will have either a balcony, a garden or a veranda. But residents voted for this because the wider environment is also going to see the huge, huge improvements with new streets, not only just the shop, but also the facilities for affordable workspace and so on. I think this is placemaking in an, an exemplar fashion, and that's what we hope to achieve. So I'll leave my remarks there. How long is left? Have I got time to introduce Councillor Williams? OK. You've got 20 seconds. OK. So um, as uh, Ward Councillor, and I'm just very pleased to uh, recommend to the Planning Committee to approve this this evening. Not least, so much detail has been taken into account in the engagement process that if you've probably seen whilst reading your packs that there's even flexibility on whether it's kitchen diners or kitchen living rooms and they're bu actually building in flexibility for, for the new tenants, which I think is just amazing. OK, thank you. Well, if you can pick up about the di designing out crime and the drying facilities during the questions, which I'm sure that we can weave them in, or unless one of the councillors wants to ask a question about that. So um, uh, any questions, please? From the committee? Councillor Corley Harris. Well, 
I'm sure you can weave this in, but it was um, it was about um, mechanical ventilation, which was mentioned earlier. I'm just wondering to what extent we're talking mechanical ventilation, because arguably a bathroom fan is mechanical ventilation. So I'm just wondering whether it's a proper um, whole block wide ventilation system that someone couldn't cover over, which we know that happens or, or take out of place just to make sure that the ventilation is in place throughout the lifetime of these units. Hi, I'm Abigail Batchelor from Caracas Luke Carson Architects. Um, so yeah, the the units for the ventilation are based per unit, the ventilation units. Um, but as was already said, the contemporary units, they're not the simple um, just for the bathroom units, but it's also for the kitchen and it's the full extract system for the whole home. So it's much better quality than something that's retrofitted in an existing home. It's really designed to be ventilated mechanically. Um, and the, but then also have the option of having dual aspects, which gives you that cross ventilation, which is so important as well um, for drying clothes, but also to overcome overheating issues with the changing climate too. And do you want me to answer the secure by design question? I can also talk to that. So we met the secure by design officers um, three times during the design process. Um, so we've been able to work with them and address their concerns. Um, through the designs and how we've designed the thresholds, how we designed the public space, how we designed the interface with the existing car parking undercrofts, which is quite complex to overcome some of those, the lack of overlooking of those spaces, but they we've worked with them. We also work with residents to understand where it was on the estate they felt unsafe. Um, and so through the urban design work, we really focused design initiatives around those areas that were identified by residents as their spaces in their neighbourhood that they felt unsafe. So we work with residents to prioritise investment that way to improve the security. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Councillor Warren. Thank you. Um, so there's reference to the, um, the proposed non-residential uses could create up to 25 additional jobs for the local community. Just wondered um, how how you'd kind of come to that conclusion. Is that, is that just to do with possible new businesses that might be able to occupy the retail and enterprise space or um, yeah, how, how that was calculated? Um, would also be grateful for an answer to um what what are residents of the estate um expected to do for medical facilities in the interim in the time between what's there currently is demolished and until the the new center is built um i i'd also yeah be grateful if you could come back on um the points that the objecting speaker made about maybe some things that might not have been fully understood when the ballot took place. Um, I think it was referenced to, yeah, it, it was referenced to the specific detail of the wellbeing hub about the number of rooms or something. And then it was also on uh, the parking proposals. If you could just come back on those points that were raised. Um, and then, yeah, that's all from me for now, thanks. So, um, picking up the medical center, the old one won't be demolished until the new one is built. So the new one will be built and then that will allow for the demolition of the old one. And so that will be up and running. Um, in terms of the jobs developed out of the non resi uses, it's a good question. I don't actually know the answer to that, but I'm you do, Adam. Um, the um, the HCA has got an employment density guide for different uses So, part of the planning application. We set out what the potential employment generation of the different non-residential uses is. And so for the uses proposed as part of the scheme, they could generate up to that amount of employment and, and obviously potential local employment. So that's where the figure came from. On the um, wellbeing hub, so the space that we're creating where the wellbeing hub will be situated is designed to be a flexible space. So there is a consulting room, but there will be also office space for other staff 
to work in, so potentially council staff to come down. So the intention is it will be a flexible space that could be expanded if, if necessary. There is another GP practice directly north to the estate and the Lawrence House who run that practice um, a five, ten minute walk from the estate. So there is, it is reasonably served in terms of medical facilities um, on the estate. In terms of the parking proposals, I think that was probably a confusion around language, around the use of the term CPZ, as um, uh, Maurice pointed out. So on the housing land, it would be a, what's will be called a TMO um, and that is what we propose to introduce and that's what we we didn't use that language but we, we use the language of introducing parking controls under the housing TMO that will include a free parking permit for every resident and every permit thereafter there comes with a cost now that's a new parking scheme the council is going to be rolling out over the next 18 months since the legislation that supported the old parking um, regime uh, fell into abeyance so that's so I, th I think there's just a bit of confusion around the use of the word CPZ as a as a kind of catch-all for parking controls. Are, and as Morris pointed out, they're different depending on the type of land. Uh, Councillor Bath. Yeah, the new jobs give me real concern because the existing enterprise centre, which was supposed to fulfil fulfil this function for many years, has failed totally. It's an utter disgrace. And my understanding is the new units will be managed by the same people. I know you saying here there be strict conditions to ensure what's happened in the past doesn't happen again, but I don't have much confidence in that. So whether you can comment on that. Regarding the retail, personally speaking, this is a bigger state. I would like to see a chain shop on that estate like Sainsbury's or, or Waitrose because I, I think the capacity needed to provide a good service, which the existing shops don't do, cannot be done by a local shopkeeper. So and I know the surrounding area doesn't have many shops either. So I really have an aspiration that you seek to get a, a national operator in that retail unit. And then a couple of things that give me concern, the courtyards. You talk about locking and unlocking the courtyards. I don't quite understand. To me, that sounds quite sad that you have to do that. And then there's a question of is someone going to turn up every morning and unlock them, which sometimes doesn't happen on some of our estates now. And then the bicycle storage is huge. And I think you've got rooms on the ground floor for the bicycles to be locked in. And I know that even on some estates where that facility is provided, they still get stolen and residents lose the confidence of using those rooms and therefore they're left there, never used, look neglected. So just a few couple of concerns there. I'll just pick up the um, concerns you have around the enterprise units and the efficacy of their operation to date. Um, I would share your concerns that it hasn't been effective, but I think that their effectiveness has been partly reflective of the effectiveness of the council and them as a as someone working together. We've been working really hard with them, with the um, economic development team to put together a new uh, lease and a new set of social value outcomes that they can work towards uh, that we will monitor uh, annually and we'll work with them in collaboration. I think the existing units suffer from uh, the design and the kind of deterioration of those units and the antisocial behaviour that they attract. I think once the new units are in place and as we are developing and strengthening that relationship with that head leaseholder that we can develop some units that are effective. But um, you know we share those concerns and we're working really hard with the corporate property unit um, to make sure that the management that's put in place and the controls the council has to manage that that legal agreement are actively managed as opposed to unactively, uh, if that's a word. Um, in terms of the operator for the shop at the ground floor of the new Moselle site, um, we share your ambition to have someone um, that is going to provide a really effective service for residents. Uh, I work on the estate at Waitrose would be fantastic, um, but we'll be working with the corporate property unit to make sure that we get someone who can run a really effective business. And I'll hand over to Abigail to pick up the bicycle storage and courtyards. 
Um, so starting with the courtyards, one of the things that we discussed with residents early on was um, that they felt that it was very specific to Broadwater, that the public space was open and accessible to everybody. Um, through the design process, we needed to balance that with concerns from the Secure by Design officers and um, colleagues, um, your colleagues from the offices who were concerned from an urban design perspective, that those spaces needed to be well overlooked and feel safe. So the um, the design hopefully works for both parties in that they can be open during the daytime, but then closed at night with the same fobs that people would use for their front doors for security. Um, so they should be always accessible to residents and then during the daytime accessible to the wider public. And that, yeah, that's something that's been designed in collaboration with the design officer and with residents. Um, in terms of the bike stores, there are planning requirements to provide a certain number of bicycles for residents. Um, the way that we've tried to work on this is through conversation with the planning officers and the GLA. Um, we have added additional storage space within each home, um, which can accommodate a bike or could accommodate a pushchair or whatever other storage they might people might need in their homes. Um, so that's the way that we've tried to reduce the impact on the ground floor, because it does take up a massive amount of space on the ground, which isn't very well surveyed. Um, and we've tried to give residents more flexibility because storage is something that residents always bring up in engagement. So we've managed to work that as a workaround. So there's more flexibility for residents in terms of that storage base and less impact of the bike stores on the ground floor. OK, thank you. Councillor Corley Harrison. Thanks. Yeah. Um, when it came to pre-app, we spoke about um, play space and the, the design of the play space. Uh, there's quite a lot of hard standing versus um, lawns and greens and whatever. And I think that was by design and by decision making or whatever. Um, and it looks like it's water play generally that's being provided as part of this design development. Is there additional uh, playground space as well, uh, either as part of the this proposal that's just not in the mock-ups or on site or is it just the water play what looks like water play which kind of is quite seasonal i can imagine um so there's different age groups for the play space so each of the courtyards has the um the doorstep play for the under fours so that's within the courtyards of the exist of the blocks um and that's green planted um as much as possible as um the planning officer said that is including the um, increase in biodiversity and urban greening factors. So that's delivered through those courtyard spaces. Um, I think the image that you're referring to is the one of the central park. Um, the reason that has more hard standing is to give one to differentiate it from the existing courtyards. So the, all the other courtyards within the estate um, are amenity grass, which has low, very low biodiversity and residents don't seem to use. They don't feel safe using it. Um, and they are, they're not appropriating it for use. Um, so this was designed with the residence design group in order to give this more hard standing, which just seems more flexible. It includes the water play, which is part of the placemaking strategy around the Moselle. So it's signaling the fact that there's rivers underneath there. And although we can't open it up as part of this um, piece of work, that it's um, part of that placemaking and understanding of the place. So that's why it's included, but it isn't the only play within the scheme. Um, and then for the older um, children, there's Lordship Rec just on the doorstep and they've got the bike track in there and the um, multi-use games there and things. So that's for the, the uh, older. Right play the there's not a specific, I think there will be play um, play elements within that community garden, uh, the community um, courtyard, yeah. So there, there is other play other than the, um, than the water space. Right. <laughs> I would just add to that as part of the further design development of the urban design framework, we'll be doing more work with residents about some of those existing courtyard spaces and how they can be further in, you know, maybe that they stay as they are, it may be that we, we further develop them into, into play space or, or other, other uses. So I think there's an opportunity as that gets more granular design um, as we go through the next conversation with residents that we can see more. Okay, all right. Yep, okay, so, um, We'll now move to the recommendation and I'd like to ask Robbie McNocker to confirm the recommendation with a summary of any changes. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, so no changes proposed by members tonight. So um, the recommendation is to grant um, planning and list the building consent um, subject to conditions as set out in the addendum. Um, and just to note that um, these are not obligations as the council is the applicant. Um, we've described them as measures which will be secured through um, an exchange of letters between directors. OK, thank you. So we'll now um, move to the uh, to the recommendation, which is to grant and that's um, both the uh, proposal uh, for the planning permission um, and also the proposal for the listed building consent. So, OK, all those in favour, please show. OK. Anyone against? Any abstentions? No. OK, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone this evening. Thank you. Just have a two minute. We'll have a two minute break.
Do we know where uh, Alex is? Okay, can you? Can I send somebody to get her, or will they mean they disappear? Is she this? Her? No. Okay, are we? Right, thank you. So we're now on to item nine, and that is Wood Ridings Court, Crescent Road, N227 R6. It's pages 233 to 346 in the pack. Um, I won't read out um, the proposal, but the recommendation is to grant, and I'll hand over to the planning officer, Valerie O'Kay, to introduce the application. So over to you, Valerie. Good evening, Chair. The proposal is for the redevelopment of the derelict Undercroft car park behind Wood Riding's Court and provision of 33 new council rent homes in four and five storey buildings, provision of associated amenity space, cycle and wheelchair parking spaces, and enhancement of existing amenity space at the front of wood riding's courts, including new landscaping, refuse, recycling stores and play space. Wood riding's court is highlighted in red. To the east is the network rail land, and the railway line and to the west is Crescent Road, the main approach street which leads into Crescent Rise to the north. Immediately south is Dagmar Road and the site is mainly surrounded by mainly terrace houses with purpose-built flats to the north. This is a bird's eye view of the site. In the first image, you can see the long disused multi-storey car park backing onto the existing Wood Riding's Court up to the boundary of the network rail land. To the east of this image is the existing communal amenity space across the front of Wood Riding's Court facing onto Crescent Road and Crescent Rise. This slide shows a number of photographs of Wood Riding's Court the existing building is a large 1960s council housing block of four storeys comprising of 56 flats. This is the ground and first floor corridors, which are dark and unpleasant. This is um, Dagmar Road access ramp to the disused parking areas. And this is the central main entry point at the front of the building and the step down from Dagmar Road to the ground floor entrance and a view looking north along the existing parking deck. And this photo shows the poor condition of the dark undercroft and deck paving areas. The proposal includes four buildings, blocks A, B, C and D of four and five storeys. 33 new council rent homes are proposed, which comprise of 10 times one bed, 19 two beds and four three beds. And the proposal will include improvements for existing tenants and leaseholders, such as new shared stair calls and lifts for the existing and future occupants of the proposed development. 
new refurbished internal walkway, improved shared access, new and enhanced shared communal amenity space, shared cycle and refuse recycling stores and wheelchair parking spaces are also proposed for the new development. The considerations include the principle of the development, quality of accommodation, high quality design, an appropriate scale, high quality new and enhanced landscaping scheme, retention of trees, new tree planting, and the proposal will have no material adverse impact on the neighbouring properties. It promotes sustainable travel and the proposal goes beyond the zero carbon policy requirements. I will now focus on one of the key issues in terms of the principle of the development. The site is being developed for council housing, which forms part of its 2018 commitment to delivering new affordable homes for rent. The proposal at Wood Ridings Court will make a valuable contribution to the council's housing supply. It seeks to provide 100% of the housing for general needs, low cost rented homes and the proposal con contributes to a mixed and balanced community and it would make a significant contribution to the delivery of the borough's wide affordable housing targets and the land at Wood Ridings Court is a brownfield location close to sustainable transport connections in an established residential area. This is the proposed ground floor plan. Four blocks are proposed to the rear of the existing building which is highlighted in red, in white, sorry. The ground floor units, which comprise of the three wheelchair accessible flats, have private amenity space. The cycle store and refuse store highlighted in grey are to the left, and a refuse store is also proposed to the front. And this is the three blue bad spaces. This is the proposed ground floor plan with pedestrian access. The green arrow highlights the pedestrian site entrance. The yellow highlights the new lift access to the upper floors for both the existing residents of Wood Ridings Court and future occupants of the proposed development. Currently, there's no lift access at all. Access to all the proposed flats are through the existing building. This slide shows the proposed first floor plan. Due to the level change on the site, an additional refuse store and cycle store is also located on this floor with access from Dagmar Road. The typical floor plan shows that there are two flats per core accessed via the shared internal corridor and there are eight proposed flats per floor and all the new flats are dual or triple aspect. This slide shows the proposed illustrated landscape plan, a communal courtyard garden for both the existing residents of Wood Riding Court and future occupants of the proposed development separates each block. The enhanced communal amenity space to the front of the existing building is divided into a larger and smaller area for child play space and it provides general amenity space for residents. This slide is a view of the proposed enhanced community communal amenity area and note the new defensible plating space uh, along the front of the existing ground floor flats, which provides some privacy. This is the proposed tree plan, which includes the planting of six new trees highlighted in green, which replaces the trees that will be removed and the trees to be removed are highlighted in yellow. The new street trees will contribute to the streetscape of Crescent Road and Crescent Ride Rise, and the proposal also includes four new feature trees highlighted in orange, and the existing trees to be retained is dotted in green. This is a view of the new communal courtyard gardens, which separates each new block. Note how the windows of the new blocks have a view onto the garden and the newly glazed facade of the internal walkway also faces onto this space. In terms of noise and vibration from trains on the nearby train track, the proposal includes double glazing 
and appropriate ventilation to mitigate any noise implications from the occasional passing trains, a soundproof wall to the railway edge that continues across the courtyards, the glazed facade is significantly improved to mitigate noise from the railway line and the scheme is carefully designed to mitigate vibration from the occasional passing trains. This is a proposed view from the railway. Note how the new buildings step down to four storeys to respond to its immediate context facing Dagmar Road. This is a closer view from the railway. The new buildings will be predominantly faced in zinc cladding with concrete cladding at ground level. The scheme has been through extensive pre-application discussions with officers in addition to feedback from local residents and the quality review panel on two occasions. This is a view looking north from Crescent Road. The pitch roof breaks down the oval bulk and massing of the proposal, softening its presence as glimpse in the wider townscape while enhancing the views from the local context. This is a view from Crescent Rise. Note how the disabled parking bays are sheltered by a car park canopy with solar panels on the roof. In terms of amenity, impact on amenity, there is no impact on the amenity of the immediate existing buildings at Wood Riding Court. There is no significant impact on the amenity of nearby residents and the proposal satisfies Bree sunlight requirements to neighbouring windows and the proposed development would also minimise the impact of construction by utilising modern methods of construction. This slide shows the sufficient separation distance of 18 metres between the proposed new buildings and this distance would ensure a degree of privacy between the proposed dwellings, given the tight constraints of the site. And note how the existing flats of the existing building are single aspects and none of the proposed flats overlook the existing dwellings. In terms of transport and parking, the existing parking court to the rear that previously served Wood Riding's court has been redundant for a number of years. The site has a P-tail of part five and part three, which is a good level of, of accessibility. The scheme is car free. It's a car free development due to most of the site's public transport accessibility levels. Free wheelchair accessible parking spaces are proposed and deliveries and service trips have been considered and agreed by transport officers. And the scheme includes 76 cycle parking spaces for existing residents and future occupants of the proposed development. This is the section 106 head of terms. Officers recommend the committee resolves to grant planning permission subject to conditions and planning obligations as set out in the committee report. Thank you. Um, so can I have questions of clarification? So I've got Councillor Corley Harrison and Councillor Boxton. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. I just want to confirm exactly what we're agreeing to given the proposals for cabinet tomorrow this is for london affordable rent not formula rent is that right um the proposal in this case is is council rent so um that would be equivalent to formula rent that, that's what's been proposed and is is in this proposal <laughs> so when cabinet if cabinet approves tomorrow you know what's in the paper which i'm sure you have seen does this application can it automatically change to to london rent rather than formula rent or what well, i don't understand what the proposal is for what's being said at cabinet and obviously this has an impact on what we're passing here tonight so i just i would like that explained uh, and i'll i've got some other questions so i'll throw those in all in one go if i may so on parking um it talks about the difference between the cpz area and the non CPZ area, which is, you know, it's basically on the border of that, that overall there isn't parking stress, but that there actually is potentially parking stress on the non CPZ area, but it's being designated as car free, which means those who want to use their car will just park on the already stressed park in the already stressed area. It seems like the intentions of going car free are obviously well and good. I, I completely agree with them. But actually on this particular application, 
they may be detrimental to what is happening in the local area. So I just want some clarification on that. Um, on the material used, um, which is like a, there's zinc cladding and concrete cladding, and it shows red in the design. Um, I would have really liked to have seen some comparables, some buildings in the report where we can see, ah, oh, so that's what it's actually going to look like. I really can't get a sense and we don't have materials here. You know, it would have been nice to actually see materials come. If it's the normal London vernacular style, fine, but this is quite different to that. So I would have quite liked to have seen that. Um, the play space to the front, the woodland space and the young children's play space, is that accessible to everyone? I know it's supposed to be for residents of the development, but presumably it would be accessible to the community. It's not gated in any way. And the um, what's called facade to the rear, which I think acts as some kind of noise buffer, according to the report. I couldn't quite work that out, how that how it, how it works as a noise buffer other than just being an extra layer, as far as I, I could tell. Um, so is there some technical element to that or is it just literally an extra an extra layer uh, that's being applied there? And the report says it mentions about noise because it's next to the train line. I think it mentions the occasional train that may go past. I mean, it's come on. You know, it's 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 one of the one of the busiest train lines in the UK. Let's let's not misrepresent in our reports. So and obviously it's big trains. Um, so are we confident with double glazing in that respect? Was triple glazing considered? Were, were other means considered um, to manage noise? And um, again, on ventilation, I should imagine that if you have trains going past quite regularly, you're probably not going to be opening your windows all the time. So what ventilation options are available on top of just passive, um, uh, whether there's mechanical and um, overheating resolutions and all of that sort of thing. Hopefully you captured it all. I can go back. So in terms of the noise and the design, the building has been designed to passive house principles, which provides thicker insulation um, with external walls and high standards of air tightness and acoustic reduction. And then the um, ground floor also has the concrete wall as well. So that's a noise barrier as well for the courtyard. Um, yeah, so that's in terms of noise. Yes. The play space, sorry, the play space is for residents, existing residents and proposed residents, but not for the rest of the community. So it's for people within the new development and existing development. Sorry? It's gated. It's a gated development. Um, having discussed the scheme with the applicants, have discussed the scheme with um, secured by design officers and um, yeah, it's gated and more secure than it is at the moment. I think Maurice is just going to come in on the CPZ point. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Councillor, you're right that the, this is right on the edge of the CPZ, uh, but it's still within the CPZ, so the policy which exists uh, requires it to be dedicated as a car-free development. In terms of the car-free development, and the TMO will be for the existing CPZ or any proposed CPZ. And as you know, we're always reviewing CPZ in terms of the boundaries of the CPZ, because it is always that when you have right on the boundary of CPZ, there's increased parking pressure. So I'm sure in, at some point the CPZ will be reviewed and residents may seek to, to have that extended. So the, the, the TMO restriction will be for this CPZ and any future CPZ. So that will restrict uh, residents uh, from applying for a permit in the future. And um, just quickly on the, on the point in council rent, um, that would require a variation if that were to be changed. So that is proposed. It's in the description of development. So um, if there are changes to that, um, that would require a change to the planning permission. Um, so um, for members tonight, you, you're considering what's in front of you as a planning application um, and, and assessing on that basis. But um, <clears throat> if that were to change, um, it would it would require an amendment to the planning permission. Um, and I'll just bring in Richard um, on the um, pre the president of the materials. 
<coughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Chair, Robbie and Councillor. Um, the best place I would point you to look at some examples of the materials is to go to look at their design and access statement, which has some excellent examples of, of um, similar red um, zinc, red patinated zinc. Um, if you get got that to hand, it's in in in, in the um, amongst the um, supportive documents to the application. Um, it's not an absolutely widely used material. No, I admit it's it, it's quite an unusual development. This this is this is um, this is us being a bit bold, uh, a bit um, exciting, I think. Um, but the the idea is that it's it's. Um, Oh, there we are. Someone's brought it out. That's really useful. Um, it, it's it's intended to look like a contemporary building. Uh, it's not trying to pretend to be something um, that that is the same as everything else around the neighbourhood. But the reddish colour, which is more a sort of bronze, rusty bronze, is intended to um, have similarities to the red brick of the surrounding, you know, two-storey terraced houses. You know, which admittedly it's set back from behind the existing wood ridings court mostly, but at the southern end on Dagmar Road, it'll face directly across Dagmar Road at a little terrace of, of two storey red brick terraced houses there. So it, it's quite right that it should um, respond with some echoes of, of, of the general colour and um, design. You know, the fenestration also gives it a, an, an echo of the current surroundings. Uh, whilst not being an, absolutely identical. But I think there's some good examples shown there. Thank you, Chair. And just to elaborate on what Robbie said in terms of the, uh, in response to the question about affordable housing. Um, so council rent and London affordable rent um, for planning purposes, they fall under the same planning policy umbrella. So you'll know we've got the percentage split um, between sort of social rent and intermediate in terms of council rent and London affordable rent. They, they do fall under the same umbrella for planning policy purposes. So there's not a lot of not a huge lot of difference between um, the two. Um, uh, and we, we call that umbrella general needs, low cost rented housing, and that's set out in planning policy and in the council's adopted housing strategy. So they generally fall under the same umbrella. Just to elaborate a bit more on what Robbie said. Thank you. Is that that's answered all of your questions? Yeah, just to confirm then we're passing for either or we would be passing. We'd be approving for either or formula rent or We'd be, we're approving for that bracket is what you're saying, basically. Yeah, um, the, the application is for council rent, so that's in the description of the development and that is what has been applied for. Um, if if the proposal wants, if, if the applicants want to come forward um, in the future to to interrogate that with a different approach, um, we will look at that and we will uh, decide uh, whether a future application is needed. Uh, has has been indicated that may well need to be the case. Um, at the moment, we've got to assess what's in front of us on the table. So the description of the development is for um, council rent, um, and that's what we're looking at. But just to give the wider context, that does fall within the umbrella in planning policy terms, um, which is acceptable. Um, I've got Councillor Buxton, Councillor Rice, Councillor White, and Councillor Dunstall. OK, so Councillor Buxton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, I just I want to uh, echo Councillor Corley Harrison's point um, uh, with the occasional passing trains. I mean, we stood there for 15, 20 minutes on Friday and there were five, six trains uh, that came past. So um, in terms of, well, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to go for a minimum, but still five uh, is one every couple of minutes. So I wouldn't say that was an occasional um, and Yes, I understand that it's a passive house, but passive house isn't necessarily designed to go next to a train station, uh, next to um, a lot of traffic. So just want to make sure that, you know, this, the noise report and uh, all of that is done on the basis that it's not just occasional passing trains, that it is a significant amount. Um, and then my second point uh, is, in terms of uh, sunlight, um, so some of the um, some of the ones that are will be 
purely facing north um, and won't get any direct uh, sunlight, I believe. Um, so I wondered whether you could just uh, explain the, um, you know, the, the sunlight access um, and the sunlight. Um, I think the word, but yeah, speak to that. On, on the aspect in sunlight, um, the main facade uh, facing the railway is roughly northeast. So anything facing that way will get morning sun. Um, obviously, all the flats are at least dual aspect. So they either face, as well, in addition to facing northeast, all the flats either face southeast into one of those courtyards or northeast into one of those courtyards. So they face southeast, they'll get loads of sun, they'll have fantastic sunlight through until the early afternoon. If they face northeast, they'll get a little bit of sun uh, in the evening as well. And then there are a couple of flats, well, all the flats on the top floor um, also have west facing windows or so southwest facing windows looking out over the roof, as do the um, upper floor flats on the at the end of the two end blocks at the northern end and the north northwestern and southern south southwestern end they get a, a southwestern window as well uh, so they're all dual aspects so they but yeah they they some of them will will mostly get sun in the morning but they'll all get some sun and i think probably just um clarifying on, on the issue of noise um i think occasionally makes the distinction from constant um, noise so it, 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 or intermittent would probably be a better word um, but yes that, that has been assessed as a um, an impact um, appropriately in the noise assessment. Councillor Rice. That's a very short question. Uh, I can't remember seeing any lift in the building as it is now. Would there be lift provision in the new extension and refurbishment? Yes, yeah, so currently there's no lifts in the existing building, but yes, there are lifts proposed for existing um, new residents. Councillor White. Thanks. It's just a quick question of clarification just about the uh, the PTEL. Um, I, I don't understand why it's part five and part three. Why, why, why is I can see Maurice is coming in to answer my question. It just seems that some, some of it should be four. I don't, I, why is it part five and part three? I'm just maybe not understanding how PTEL works. Uh, if I may, Councillor, I think the way PTEL work is that the distance from away from the interchanges. So essentially the bit that falls into freeze just outside the walking distance to, to one of the public transport nodes. But essentially you would normally do a site PTEL, specific PTEL, because those are based in Polygon, and you, you're right, all average between um, four and five for this one, but it, it's acceptable in terms of part of the site falling into the five for car free development. Um, thank you, Councillor Dunst. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, similar similar to the noise, but, but vibrations. Um, and in the same paragraph that Councillor Corley Harrison uh, cited, um, it just says it's been carefully designed to mitigate vibration from the occasion. We've, wrong, we've covered the occasional bit, haven't we? But um, I wondered what specifically has been done. Is it just that the northern part is further away from the train tracks? Is there anything within the building of itself to mitigate, um, you know, my, uh, vi vibrations over the longer term for, for residents? Um, I, I think it, it, it's really, you know, as, as simple as a um, well insulated windows and a, and a um, thick facade. Um, we might get some more from the applicant, but um, that's really what's gone into that and um, what's been assessed in, in the noise report. OK, right, thank you. So we'll now move on to objecting councillors. Excuse me, so Councillor Rossetti. Uh, you have three minutes. Good evening. Uh, the points I want to make is about the neighbourhood 
and what would be the future residence of the of the building. So in terms of uh, neighborhood, you I don't know if you have a chance to look at all the concern that being raised by the existing residents and uh, the volume of the of the new building is going to be eight meters higher than the existing one. So it would be visible from everywhere, not just I appreciate that it's the protected view that has been looked at, but it will be visible. So it's not clear to me why with the residents that they need to do refurbishment of building in line with the surrounding and then the council decide to do something completely different, something just because it's bold and it's not in line with the with the neighborhood. The word policy DM1 and DM12, the word question and I haven't seen any any comment about this. The fact that it's already a congested area has been mentioned. The parking is a nightmare. I think the transport assessment has calculated in additional 18 parking places available. This is going to be 33 flat. Who is going to check that it's going to be car free? I agree it's a good, uh, you know, there is a lot of public transport uh, and it's very well connected, but that doesn't mean the families will not have a car. So we might ask residents not to use the car for the small movement, but a family will have a car. So this will uh, increase the, the, the pressure, the parking pressure on the place. Uh, the place will be a nightmare, a logistical nightmare for a year of construction and building. There's going to be parking suspensions across the road, which means additional pressure on the parking. Lorries, which are planned to be 16.5 meters long. Um, the building works uh, operationally, the site will go from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So why from 6 a.m.? Because possibly the developers, they know that it's impossible to get into the site because of the congestion, the traffic and the parking in uh, 8 o'clock. Coming to the development, um, I'm very concerned about the vibration and the noise, and I suggest everyone to please read the, the noise and vibration assessment. It's a continuous, uh, should be possible, should be sufficient, the mitigation should be sufficient to, you know, uh, um, make up for the vibration and noise. Uh, ground floor and northern side, uh, the, the, the service has the adverse comment is possible. Uh, the occasional passing trains went from 528 trains between 7 and 23 in 2021 to 762 in 16 hours. This means 47 trains an hour and uh, uh, 53 trains uh, during the night. So it's not passing by. It's a lot of noise, it's a lot of vibration, and I haven't seen anything in the report that really reassured me that those people living there will not suffer from the vibration. Please have a look at the report. And uh, one of the conditions lists a long okay. list of plans. Sorry, just just a long list of condition and plans. The report, the vibration report says that uh, more advice should be sought in the design place, but haven't in the design phase, but I haven't seen any more additional uh, report commission on the vibration. So please have a look. And my recommendation is that you refuse this planning application and you ask you, the okay, officers to thank, look at it again. Thank you. Can you Thanks. right? Thank you. So um members can ask questions. If you want to stay there. Councillor Rossetti, because there might be some questions. Are there any questions for Councillor Rossetti? No, OK, so thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so we now move on to the applicant uh, supporters, which I think is. Is that you? Um, so that's Jack Gold and then you will introduce other speakers, OK? Thank you. Evening Chair and members, uh, Jack Gould Housing Delivery Team. Sitting next to me is Roy Collado, Collado Collins, the project architect, and of course, Martin Cowie, with whom you're familiar from the um, housing delivery team planning side. The development of wood ridings replaces a vermin infested, disused, area of Undercroft parking. The parking's been disused for something over 25 years. The area currently suffers from a significant amount of antisocial behaviour, uh, including but not limited to drug dealing and other yeah, even less pleasant activities. The site is dangerous for current residents 
and um, if members review the responses to the planning application, they'll see that none have come from residents in the existing block because we've spent 18 months engaging with residents in the existing block to achieve the scheme that is before you this evening. Um, the matter of vibration has been raised by a number of councillors. A vibration assessment was undertaken by using vibration monitors over a period of days, so they monitored all of the passing trains day and night, and the vibration calculation has been done based on a sound engineering philosophy. There will be further design development if planning consent is granted at the next stage of development, which will be the engineering detail of the drawings. Roy, I'm going to pass on to now to talk about some elements of the design. Thank you. Um, just to sort of very briefly try to pick up on the salient points raised. Um, the character of the existing building, as Jack has uh, mentioned, it has no elevators. Um, the front gardens, in addition to the back gardens, are not used by residents. We spoke to all of them and none of them um, are comfortable or happy um, to use the front gardens. And the lower two floors, the corridors are um, completely walled in, so they're, they're dark. Um, it is a really technically challenging site. There's absolutely no sort of um, getting away from that. Um, and our response to that has been to um, sort of reorganise the circulation to create an internal street for both buildings. So it's not a new building and an old building. Um, that term walkway um, is uh, sort of visually connects all of the community together, residents old and new, punctuated with three new courtyards. Um, the new glazing that edges that walkway is built to a much higher standard than the existing sort of single level, single layer of, of, of rattly glass. Um, so there are layers. Um, one of the other um, virtues of zinc is one of the, the biggest um, conversations with residents was the journey um, of delivering this building whilst they are residing um, in, in situ. Um, and the whole the design was completely moved towards a modular solution so that it could be virtually lifted into place over a concrete base and that was part of the reason that we switched then to um, a zinc because it's light um, it's a recycled material um, and we also thought that the expression of the lines on the facade was quite fun against the railway tracks because there are lots of railway tracks um, there so it's sort of gently contemporary rather than sort of in your face modern OK, thank you. Um, are there any questions from councillors? Councillor Bevan. Yeah, I know I know this site well, so I appreciate what you say about the complexity of it and the fact that not a single resident there has objected. And if you look at the quality review panels report on page uh, page uh, two, four, seven, I think it is, is quite complimentary about the scheme and the ambitious that you're trying to achieve. I just want a question about modern methods of construction because I'm not convinced because I think they might have said that about Broadwater Farm when it was first built. We're using modern modern methods of construction, so I'm, I'm still not convinced on that aspect for generally, basically. But one minor point, you talked about the, the play areas being locked or could all the residents in this scheme, the existing and the new ones, use the play areas? Yeah, OK, thanks. Shall I answer the point about modern methods, Chair? Um, the method we're using, and Councillor, you're quite right, um, modern methods often recycle some of the oldest design that are available to us. But the method we're using is called the seismic method. So it works on a component kit of parts. If you imagine an aeroplane being built. It's not all built in a muddy field in Stansted. Um, the different components are brought with the best quality materials. They're assembled off site in a factory and then the aeroplane goes to the airport and hopefully takes off. And it's the same principle so that we are sourcing the best materials for each element of the task rather than, as has happened in the past, having to buy somebody's box which is what's happened with modern methods in the past. We're sourcing different methods for each part of the building using the best equipment and materials that we can buy. 
they will be assembled off site and then they'll be brought to site to be lifted in place. And if I can just pick up a point that Councillor Rossetti made earlier, um, she talked about, rightly talked about road closures. The whole purpose of using this method is that rather than having a building site that operates for 18 to 24 months, the site will operate for 8 to 12 months, 12 in total, including the demolition phase, and the number of road closures for delivery of and installation of modules will be limited to less than 10 working days, unlike a normal site where, of course, road closures are habitual almost throughout, throughout the currency of the project. Thank you. So, got, so got Councillor Corley Harrison and Councillor Warren. Councillor Corley. <coughs> Thanks. I just. Um... I just need to clarify the construction stuff because what's in the construction statement appears to be different to in the report. So I'm just trying to work out which one is accurate. So, for example, construction statement says the hours of operation are, as Councillor Rossetti said, 6 a.m. till 6 p.m. The report says 8 a.m. till 6 p.m., which is obviously usual. Um, and then also the area in question at the moment is a camera monitored HGV restricted zone. So I'm just wondering how that works given you know for 12 days there will be nine to ten articulated vehicles going to this location and then the construction plan there's a delivery route outlined um and it seems to it indicate going back out of present rise and turning right onto Dernsford, which you can't do so i'm just again i can't see how that adds up and how I can't really see how articulated lorries are going to get down there, to be quite honest, um, given the um, the dual parking on both sides. And then there's a me mention in the report about restricting deliveries between peak times, uh, seven till nine, four till six. So there's 10 articulated lorries being squeezed in between that time. No. Um, and also the peak time in that area, because a lot of it is school traffic and um, traffic actually bypassing the A406. So it tends to be around 3 p.m. So can we extend it from 4 p.m. to 3 p.m. till 6? So I don't know, maybe this construction plan will be updated or whatever, but there seems to be a lot that I'm not, it doesn't add up totally with the report. Thanks. Uncertain, Chair. Um, just to clarify the misapprehension, these are not long articulated lorries. Each one of the modules occupies a space 3.8 metres by 4.2 metres, so they go on a conventional truck. They're not long articulated lorries. I'm not sure where the issue of timing came in. I suspect that's a typo. Um, it will be the standard timing that every other planning application is required to observe. The construction logistics plan will be a matter of condition um, if committee uh, agrees to grant consent. It'll be a matter of condition imposed and monitored by officers and the delivery team will have to provide a detailed logistics plan, including the detail of where the lorries travel to and from and how they get out again that will meet the requirements of planning officers and the highways team. Um, Councillor Warren. Thank you. Um, I just appreciate if officers could respond a little bit to the points Councillor Rossetti was making about um, local parking pressures and the eventuality that even just a, a few of the people that move into the new homes have cars and need to put them somewhere. Um, and also, I was wondering, we've obviously all got concerns about uh, the proximity to the, the trains um, and the noise. Obviously, there are already people that live there who seem to, you know, presumably manage OK, and it's not that much further away but I was also thinking um there might actually is it, is it the case that there might be a bit of improvement for some of those in the existing blocks because there will be a kind of added so yeah there's a bit there's kind of pros and cons there 
Um, taking the latter point, um, you're absolutely right. The improvement for those people living in the existing Wood Riding School building, which is not a well insulated building being built as it was at a time when construction methods were not particularly good, um, will be very significant indeed. The noise attenuation will be uh, measurable and appreciable by the 56 families living in the existing block. Um, I'm not sure I can add much to what Maurice said earlier about the parking and I don't know if Maurice is still online and wants to try and answer the question. Yeah, um, yeah sure Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to come in here. So um, we've done a analysis of the car parking available on site and we've done two scenarios. A, a best case scenario where a car will park in a five meter bay length and are showing in excess of 100 spaces available and it's taking into account the 18 displaced spaces. And then we look at a worst case scenario where a car is going to use six meter bay length to park. Uh, we, call, we normally call that a sensitivity. And even with the 18 space displaced, we still have about 57 car parking space available. You are right that with the CPZ only in one section, there there is an inequality there and in that more people will try and park outside of the CPZ, probably not to get a permit. But that's the very nature of roads being on the edge of a CPZ, uh, with or without this development proposal, that you would get more people parking on the edge of the, the CPZ. But in time, and this normally happens, residents normally campaign for a CPZ when a car parking pressures get high. And as, as I said before, this is a car-free development in that a car-free restriction will apply to the current CPZ and any future CPZ. And we'll make sure that residents is a requirement to make sure that residents move into these flats know that it's a car free development. Thank you very much. So that's it. OK, so um, we'll now move to the recommendation. I'd like to ask Robbie McNocker to confirm the recommendation with a summary of any changes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um... Sorry, what? Councilor? Just wanted to update that. Um, the timing. Uh, oh, OK, sorry about that. 4 yeah. till 3. And can we make it so that it is a condition rather than just a try your best behaviour, which is what it kind of is worded as at the moment? Sure, if yeah. um, someone can point me to the yes. Uh, I think um, condition 13 sets out um, the CMP, which um, Says a point two um, details a uh, two seven one. So unless that's anywhere else, um, I think we can go forward on that basis that that it's already controlled. Yeah, so um, it's page 272, what's section C5, timing of deliveries to and removals from the plot. So the, the four o'clock there would be changed to three o'clock and the where possible removed. Yep, apologies, Councillor. Um, I thought you were referring to the, the hours of construction. So yes, um, uh, recommendation is to um, grant subject to conditions. So with that amendment um, to condition 13, um, part uh, B, uh, Roman numeral five, um, part C, Roman numeral five, um, and then um, as set out in the addendum. OK, so uh, the recommendation is to grant, so we'll move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. OK, anyone against? Any abstentions? No. OK, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. OK, so we'll now move to the pre-application briefings, if we can all quickly get in change. 
OK. Right, so we're on to item 11, land adjacent to 341 and 339 and 341A Cara House, Seven Sisters Road and to the rear of 341 and 343, Seven Sisters Road. This is pages 347 to 382. Uh, the proposal is set out in the pack and I'm going to ask Philip Elliott to introduce the report, please. Thank you. Quickly, please, Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to do a quick introduction now. OK, uh, so this is a pre-application briefing on a mixed use warehouse living um, and commercial scheme in the south of the borough in Hermitage and Gardens Ward. Um, warehouse living in the Haringey context is proposed as a technical term and is defined as the occupation on a communal basis of a large footplate building, which is a mixed residential and employment use. It is considered to be a sui generis use class. So the site is on the corner of Seven Sisters Road and Ede Road in the Haringey Warehouse District. Um, it is made up of land to the front and rear of Car House, which is a six storey residential building that was um, formerly offices. Um, it's also made up of a vacant plot on the corner of Ebe Road and Seven Sisters Road, which has levels that drop um, quite dramatically to the north of the site. Uh, there's also a public right of way that is made up of a narrow stairwell. And there's also land to the rear of 341 and 343 Seven Sisters Road, um, which fronts onto Cheeksbury Road. Um, so the site is surrounded to the north and west by warehouses and industrial buildings, um, some of which remain in commercial and industrial uses, um, and some uh, in whole or in part, which have fallen into residential uses. So to the west of the site um, and site allocation uh, 34 is a protected locally significant industrial site. Um, 
that's the uh, area highlighted purple on this image, which includes Florentia Clothing Village and the former uh, Maynard Sweet Factory. Uh, so the site itself falls within site allocations 34 and 35, which support the development of um, mixed use floor space, uh, including warehouse living, as well as um, increased accessibility across the site. Uh, the site, as you can see here, uh, sits within a group of allocations in the district that support regeneration um, and warehouse living accommodation. So that's mainly these sites in orange. So that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. So the applicant, you can present the report and then we'll have questions and comments from the committee after that. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think uh, trying to um, upload our presentation and we'll, we'll take you through that. But uh, just briefly to say that um, as I think we've uh, we met some of some of the members and officers on site last week, so I try not to repeat um, too much what we said then, but we have essentially been on a bit of a journey um over the last couple of years with the, the help and the assistance of the officers uh, along the way warehouse living as it's emerged in this area is as far as we know unique to haringey um and uh, unique to this part of haringey and it, it's represented the um, conversion of former industrial and warehouse buildings for people to live collectively um, and work collectively within those buildings each one has been adapted according to the um according to the you nearly there according to the sort of volumes and the floor plates of the um of the ex uh, industrial buildings and have been adapted for the sort of uses that take place within them but this uh, moment represents a, a very significant departure for us because this is the first time that we seek to build a new building for the purpose of warehouse living occupation so everything else has been somewhat serendipitous and buildings have uh, have been converted really according to their own dimensions and then have become inhabited uh, as people found uses for the spaces within them and found ways to live and work together. But we have essentially run out of buildings to convert and to adapt. And we also have some stock within our holding, which really is at the end of its life and uh, will need to be in due course removed and replaced. We're committed to the principle of warehouse living uh, we want to, we've worked very hard uh, to uh, secure the recognition of warehouse living as the predominant use across this area. But as I say, to, to ensure the longevity of warehouse living in the area, we have to be able to build new. And what we've been trying to do over recent years is to find a form of building which to some extent mimics um, the former industrial buildings uh, as converted for warehouse uh, living purposes. But we're not in, in saying that, trying to set a, a fixed blueprint. So we expect our buildings as we go forward to show as much variety and adaptability uh, as the, the stock that we've inherited from previous industrial uses. We're starting uh, with the site on Seven Sisters, which we'll, we'll talk you through hopefully in a moment. Um, and we've begun with a very complicated site, as you will see. So it's a site that is eight metres higher at the front than it is at the rear. Uh, it involves uh, adapting uh, a narrow alleyway, a stepped alleyway, and it involves the relocation of some major services, particularly a substation. But we wanted to begin on a site that was empty, a site that is vacant, and begin this long-term journey, we hope, of renewal across the area so that we can allow people, um, when we do interfere with existing buildings, to have the opportunity to move into new buildings before we then work on the next site. And we're setting in motion um, an attempt to move around the area um, in a coordinated fashion. And that at the moment is governed by a framework document, which we put together with officers over the last couple of years. It's not quite complete, but it's, 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 uh, it's almost complete for its initial purposes. It's a document that describes life within the area and talks about how we will make progress site by site into the future. We expect it to be a living document. We expect it to adapt over time because the nature of this whole area is that it's a, it has evolved uh, really quite org organically and, and quite gradually. Uh, and, and I really wanted to say, because you'll just to try and bear in mind as we go through this, uh, we absolutely recognise that you know we've got to we've got to work our way through a regulatory process. 
but we would hope you just have some, you know, some sympathy for the fact that actually the freedom to create these spaces that people I think place so much value on, and so much enjoy living and working in, has itself been a product of a kind of freedom for people to make changes to the buildings in the way that have suited their occupation. So we're trying, I think, to, to tread a fine line between being responsible in the way that we go about now, managing the estate, changing the estate, adding new buildings to the estate, but also trying to continue to allow people the freedom to live and to work um, and, and to, to operate in combination uh, without, being, uh, without being continuously directed uh, by a landlord that thinks it knows best. So on that basis, Dave is going to um, talk through the work that he and his team have been doing on the Seven Sisters site. Great. Good evening. Hi, I'm uh, David Storing, uh, director at Morrison Company. I brought along every single digital device and we've <laughs> finally connected, so that's fantastic. So thank you for the intro. So, um, So I understand the uh, the planning committee have, have visited the site um, uh, last Friday. So I'll sort of I won't go so much into the into the site as 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 much our development and the scheme as it currently stands. Uh, so this is the site on the corner of Seven Sisters Road and Ede Road, um, and the task here was, as, as Chris has said, to how do we build a new build, uh, warehouse, live, work, development on this currently empty site, um, as identified by the framework document. Uh, this this corner identified for a marker building, which would identify the warehouse district, which is currently hidden away uh, from Seven Sisters. Um, how do we elevate warehouse living in a in a new build uh, version of that, maximising the opportunity and viability on the site, and also maximising the commercial uh, and ground and activation, which currently um, is uh, is is in need of um, significant updating. So, just in terms of what uh, the objectives are and what Sorry, it takes a little while to. Yeah, uh, in terms of the project objectives, so the development of a new type of affordable, adaptable communal living and working, um, supporting creative industries and micro businesses, and the ingredients that surround that are set out there in these six images: volume of space, flexibility of use, adaptability of the space, this crossover of living and working relationship in the same space enabling the community to have a sense of ownership uh, and the importance of amenity space, which is adaptable by the community. And as set out in the larger fra framework document, uh, the main objectives, sorry, yeah, main objectives there are to retain and expand the creative community that's there, a healthy place to live and work, increasing um, employment offer, meeting the needs of the community, um, importance of uh, the affordability, adaptability, safety and security, a big consideration here, and maintaining this distinctive warehouse character and also engagement with the wider community. On sustainability, we've uh, been pushing for the utmost standards on the scheme and you'll see um, we've pushed for a 30% improvement on Part L, uh, meeting the GLA on embodied carbon. Um, and looking at well-being uh, and biodiversity in the scheme uh, as very important factors. And then just a bit of background on warehouse living. Just coming up. So I understand um, you managed to gain some access to, to some of the units um, and have a good understanding of the area. How that sits within the, the policy and um, document for warehouse living um, and, and this scheme being directly developed for that. Some images there of it's a little lag sorry <laughs> okay yeah some images there from inside some of the units um, uh, that you may have seen but the importance of the organic nature of the development and uh, inhabitation as chris spoke about and the importance of how we create an architecture that allows for um, the the community to to adapt and um, make it part of the warehouse living importance of the people within that um, lots of uh, there's a part of a um, sorry part, as part of the scheme uh, lots of consultation and meetings with the residents and they've very been much part of the journey um, and supportive along the way um, and being very sort of vocal in 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 guiding the scheme uh, through conversations with them uh, and workshops and some of the characters down there at the bottom uh, which are picked out in more detail in the framework 
there's a there's a baker um, using the kind of warehouse district as part of that business and a, a, an older musician. I suppose a kind of mixture of ages, but perhaps kind of leaning to the younger age, but actually uh, kind of transcends that across uh, the warehouse district. And then a slide there talking about the research into all of the existing warehouse typologies in the area and how kind of sketches there of how these uh, multiple bedrooms are, are centered around communal living spaces. The importance of the individual bedrooms, everything from five to 15 beds around a shared communal work live space, and then how these spaces feed on to external spaces where the whole community can come together. And then about understanding the levels of sharing within the warehouse district and the importance of um, the kind of individual bedroom, one to two people, through to kind of shared bathroom facilities, through to breakout, um, and then all the way to the bottom to the larger spaces where the whole of the community can come together and the importance of defining these spaces through uh, the architecture. Site context. Uh, OK, so uh, we set out a plan there. So this is Seven Sisters Road on the right hand side and Ede Road off um, to to the left. We've got the empty site um, you see on number two, which is currently flat uh, concrete with um, with some trees dropping down to the lower level on Tewkesbury. And then we've got Cara House labelled as one existing warehouse live work retained on the site. So very important that this scheme coming forward is building on uh, empty vacant land and these residents will be retained. So this scheme doesn't displace any warehouse residents. Um, also working to the rear of Cara House to improve their facilities. And importantly, the, the alleyway that runs through the site, um, currently I think locally known as Piss Alley, it's kind of got, got uh, negative and uh, security issues and there's a very much important part of the scheme is improving that. We've got the terraces on um, Seven Sisters Road, and then we've got the car breaker down to Tewkesbury at the back. And also the application includes the end of Tewkesbury Road, um, and you'll see looking to bring improvements to, uh, to that road currently as part of this scheme. And also a large part is uh, relocating a number five, which is an open substation, uh, moving that out of this route through to improve this route down between Seven Sisters and Tewkesbury. The constraints, so we've got Seven Sisters Road, uh, noise pollution. We've got lack of links across um, the busy road there. We've got lack of activated facade all the way along uh, Ede Road. And then we've got the, we talked about the route down. Um, it's kind of security issues down there. Again, all really inactive, the substation. And also the, the, the difficulty of the change in level between Seven Sisters and Tewkesbury, which is around um, eight, nine meters, so kind of significant change on the site. And then which effectively doesn't allow uh, the routes down into into the into uh, seven, into the um, warehouse district opportunities. So the corner, an opportunity for a marker building, a building of some height um, and then a lower block in front of Cara House to avoid impacting daylight sunlight to Cara House and then enclosing some amenity for Cara. The importance of that new route down, uh, linking into the warehouse district, again, a new gateway, a route down into the warehouse district, activation of that either side of that route down and an opportunity for some uh, work units down where the current car break is. is. In terms of some images here about the building up the brief. So again, these these characters um, in the in the warehouse district, activation of this route down into the warehouse, uh, community uses, working, making spaces um, and and uh, and music spaces. So real activation of this ground plane that's currently really inactive and making sure the uh, lots of overlooking and security and a really generous route down where those current steps are. And then above that, the new warehouse living. Um, so this is a series of rooms and they vary in numbers around a shared communal living and workspace. This um, Duncan in the warehouse district, he's a, he's a bike mechanic and he uses part of the um, kind of shared living workspace to repair bicycles. So this is kind of this overlay of living and work all happening at the same time. And then this builds up to be 
this diagram um, and we'll take you through the plans on that. So just in terms of units, so it's a mix of units, as we say. So these in, in is kind of a mixture of five to 14 bed units um, split between a kind of 70, 30, one and two bed provision. So 30% um, two bed and then 10% of those being wheelchair accessible. And the key there is that as the number of bedrooms increases, that shared living and communal space increases and the generosity that you get through having uh, these these shared um, facilities. And detail here are the bedrooms. So the in terms of technical requirements, the development meets BCO plus, uh, sorry, <laughs> HMO plus. So effectively taking HMO as the base principle and then building and improving upon that. And that's all set out in detail in the framework document. And this example here takes uh, a bedroom comparison. So on the left hand side, a HMO bedroom um, and then the warehouse district bedroom. So um, effectively, the through the use of um, height within the units, so a standard HMO bedroom at two and a half metres in the warehouse district, it's increased ceiling height of 3.1 metres, which allows the residents to utilise that volume. So in the warehouse district, you'll see a number of examples where they put a raised bed. So effectively maximising the use of that area. And on a comparison, it gives you, say, 30 percent more usable area by removing the bed from the lower level. And also on a volume basis, uh, the space is, is kind of 30 percent more um, generous. Double height spaces. Um, again, the importance of those. Um, Time-wise, we okay. I'll fly through. <laughs> and then, in terms of fit out, it's kind of base build fit out, which again allows the residents to add their own personality to it. The importance of amenity space, um, and also amenity space on the roof. So, and also this shared community space where they come together. So, what we we'll do is quickly through the plans development. Um, so in terms of how this, the, the plan was developed, it's set out off of the existing buildings. The importance of this six metre wide route where the current tight staircase is, and then setting out the geometries of the block, uh, setting out from Cara Yard, Cara House by 15 metres. Um, and then this sets out the geometry for the two blocks. The front taller block from Seven Sisters Ground plus seven storeys and the lower block three storeys. We're setting back at the top of the taller block and then pushing in to form balconies, um, which you'll see in the scheme later. As we said, lots of consultation with the residents. And I'll go through, I think I'll quickly go through the floor plans and then I'll finish on CGIs. So this is the lower level. So we're down at Tewkesbury level, the lower level there. As we said, the end of Tewkesbury being taken as a, over as a shared uh, road space, um, removing the currently kind of cars and et cetera on the, on, on the laneway there. We've got a series of containers which house smaller uh, affordable workspaces, creating this larger route up to um, up to the stair up to Seven Sisters. And that's lined with um, work units, maker units, kind of smaller containers, but then some of these larger maker units. And as we go up a level, it's two stories of the uh, containers stacked. <coughs> Um, up a generous staircase, up to Seven Sisters. Yeah, I'll check a bit of water. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, and then up the staircase, which has got planting in it, and then a uh, cafe space that feeds out onto Seven Sisters, bins, bikes, generous provision. <coughs> oh, sorry. And route through into Cara House. The entrances to the warehouse buildings are from Cara Yard. Uh, entrance to the, to the taller block and the lower block. Again, lots of bicycle provision seen very much as. OK, so it's gated to Cara Yard. Again, this is a kind of shared um, yard space. Again, people working in, in Cara Yard, bringing in deliveries, etc., but also mm. uses amenity space. And then we've got one warehouse unit here, a uh, five bed, which effectively is set two stories above as it drops down to Tewkesbury. I'll go up to the. Um, this one last. OK, yeah. <clears throat> OK, the upper levels. So we've got a central stair core. 
a generous stair call with a light well up the middle out into a, a generous lobby space, two large lifts so they can bring bikes and uh, making equipment, etc. Onto two entrances, it's basically a butterfly plan. You come th through the lobby directly into the living making space. That's really important for creating the community within uh, within these units so that people aren't just sneaking into their bedrooms. That's a, something driven by the residents. They're very keen on that. You come into this space, <coughs> you've got kitchen here out onto um, double height space and then on balcony onto the front. And then a series of bedrooms off of a corridor um, with uh, bathroom provision <coughs> in the corridor. <coughs> Apologies. So yeah, both of those living spaces, double aspect uh, and, and butterflied. And then the lower block, um, a uh, standalone block again with its own lift uh, and staircase. So those those um, to the larger units you'll see that they're stacked. So a series of kind of just to go back here. How many more slides to go through? Yeah, that's David. Yeah, you'll see it in yeah, that's yeah. Can we get yeah? Let's get to the pictures. <laughs> get the pictures, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Materials um, we picked up on the kind of industrial and corrugated um, and we've got a cement board. Um, fly through these, get through to the pictures very quickly. OK, just got to catch up with me. <clears throat> OK, so these are the latest um, artistic views. So this view here of uh, from Seven Sisters Road. So you're looking down the gap between the terraces. So this creates the new route down into the warehouse. You've got the ground floor there. You've got the cafe that's spilling out onto onto the staircase. And then above it, you've got three sets of 14 bed warehouse units with these double height spaces coming out onto this amenity. And then you're seeing the lower block further down Eid Road with a route through. Straight on view there. So a series of. Um, we've got the corrugated cement uh, cladding. And then we're picking up on a colour, perhaps not so clear in this image here, but a colour on the window and the metalwork across the scheme. Um, and then say up on the roof there, the importance of kind of residents taking over that terrace and it being part of, you know, uh, kind of an installation that they're forming up there at the moment. This is the route through uh, to Kari Yard. So a um, kind of signage sitting above there. This is an external fire staircase. So yeah, just to mention the buildings two fire, sta fire escape staircases, so um, kind of really robust fire strategy as part of the development. You'll see solar shading on the facade there, so this corrugated metal in the green, so overheating being dealt with um, within the scheme. There you go, and then the view down, so you're, 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 just, you're just coming past the terraces walking up Seven Sister Road and the staircase is dropping down. Um, the cafe there with with seating out onto this corner. So this is the kind of um, and then the terrace, the, the kind of uh, balcony for the um, the residents above and you're seeing that double height space. So this is the kind of stacking of those two units. A view looking back up Tewkesbury and at the moment, you know, that road's kind of littered with 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 cars, um, clearing out the end of the road there into a kind of shared space with with planting. Um, we're achieving a urban greening factor of uh, 0 0.35 and hitting 0 0.4 across the the whole district. So kind of introducing permeable uh, and, and planted um, as much as we can. And you just see there the two story containers. I, I'm going to have to ask because it's, it's is this the last one. All right, then I've got you down, councillor. Don't worry. This is the last one. All right, mm -hmm. quickly, quickly then. So this is where we stood yeah. at the bottom of the steps uh, uh, last week, looking up at mm -hmm. the widened stairway. Cool. Yeah. That was right. An internal shot. Back to the beginning, is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's inside. Okay, inside great. The yeah. All right, okay. So, Councillor Ovat's had a hand up for ages. So. Thank you, Chair. Just got three questions. Um, the first one being, in terms of the employment offer, will this entail um, priority offer for local residents and businesses? Um, second question is, um, how will the design deal with noise nuisance and air pollution? Because I can see that it's right on the the busy road. Um, so, because um, there could be, you know, potential air pollution impact on on the residents there. And then, how will the waste be managed? Um, 
what would the facilities be? Because it's a mixture of residential and commercial. Thanks. Can I try to do the first point? In terms of, um, we have begun a discussion uh, with officers about this on, on the local employment. I mean, the trite answer in a way is when people come to live here, they become local residents and they, uh, and they, they become local businesses if they're running the business from there. So sort of by definition. But we know that there's obviously an interest in trying to target some of this provision specifically for local people. And we're very open, very open to the idea of that. We're not quite sure moment quite how one would do it. You know, what would be what would what would qualify a young person coming in here? Well, at the moment we do we know that we get people who have grown up in Harringay, but we get people coming from across London and, and, and also much further beyond. It's an area that has draws people from around the whole of the country and also it's a very international area as well. Uh, we also have some people coming here from being students in uh, in London and there's certain um, certain groups, uh, particularly um, particularly I think in, in art and design areas where there is obviously a real value in people coming together from a wide variety of backgrounds. So we're very open to the idea of making sure that we provide some targeted assistance into the local area, but I just put it in that broader context that is a really very diverse and um, uh, and quite international um, uh, enterprise that, that that operates here. But we're very happy to talk about yeah, you know, if you've got in mind an idea of, of a sort of a definition or a group definition that would would achieve the the end purpose that you have in mind. We're very very open to that. So, yeah, on the technical ones, um, so air quality and noise. So we've undertaken um, air, air quality and noise assessments and the scheme is compliant with that. I think the first thing to say is that the scheme is designed um, around passive house principles based on a mechanical heat recovery system. So it can operate with the windows closed um, is the important thing. Um, and so, and the scheme, as I say, has uh, complies both with the uh, with the with the noise and, and pollution. The windows are openable, but it's your choice. So effectively, you can leave them closed, and you'll still be getting natural ventilation. Um, so I think that that deals with that with that concern. And also, in a way, this scheme provides a buffer for car a house behind, which doesn't have that level of you know double glaze windows and mechanical re heat recovery system. So it actually improves uh, the the aspect for car behind. And then in terms of bins, um, the um, provision, the the commercial units at ground are demarcated with with separate uh, bin stores, but the warehouse live work is has has its own provision. So if that makes sense. So we have a trade waste contract to remove uh, waste from the sort of non residential elements in relation to the residents. Obviously, you know, people live there and pay council tax and they have regular collections. It has been uh, as some councils will know a big issue to try and sort out bins in this area. Um, as if you, if you uh, Overbury Road, for instance, uh, we had this problem constantly overflowing um, uh, regular domestic bins uh, and also lack of control over who was putting rubbish into them. Uh, wasn't always the residents, people passing through and getting mixing of recycled and, and general waste. And we've gone a long way to sorting that out. We've, we've put Euro bins in. We've issued um, codes to people so they can use the locks on it. And that's sort of helped organise that. It's kept the road the street much tidier quite and we've had a big improvement we're not quite as constant improvement there. i think actually you might have some of the bin runs in the borough a little bit hit and miss i think we only haven't quite been hitting their, their weekly targets but it's a whole lot better in this scheme obviously we're designing it in from the outset so we have bin storage areas and we have access for bin lorries to come into the site to take waste away so it'll be much easier to do here um, yeah. okay thank you councillor white Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so first of all, uh, I just want to ask the applicant to you. You mentioned in your introduction that um, you're saying that this type of warehouse living is is unique to, to Harringay. And so I just wondered if you could be just expand a little bit more on that and in what way it's different from the kind of warehouse living that happens in places like Hackney Wick and you know places like that. Secondly, um, on the walking and cycling front, um, uh, it's great, obviously, to see the proposed improvements to the, uh, the, the 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 stairway down from Seven Sisters Road. But is there any possibility that we can 
um, ask for a contribution to cycling infrastructure here, particularly given that there was there was a long standing proposal for a strategic London cycle route um, in this area, the um, uh, cycle future route two, was it two? Yeah, uh, which seems to have been put on the back burner, but whether there's any 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 anything in that regard we can we can ask for. And then uh, um, thirdly, I just wanted to ask about affordability. Um, so it says in the papers that this is a, a um, it's it's not really because it's a kind of sui, sui generis uh, use. We don't have a policy where we we we, we can we can um, uh, require a certain proportion of of affordable uh, housing. However, you know, although this is living and working space, it is place where you know it is the the, the home of, of people who are going to be Haringey residents. And I think it is really important that we 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 provide homes, affordable homes for people. So I'm just wondering what levers we've we've got, um, if any, to. Uh, uh, to, 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 to get that affordability and particularly uh, in view of what we heard on the site visit about how there's quite often in this type of um, um, living, uh, there's, there's maybe even a couple of levels of, of subletting there where the rents that are being charged by the ultimate landlord aren't necessarily what's paid by the, the the people who are actually living in in the flats and uh, in 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 the homes and um that can be much much higher so what can we do in policy terms to 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 restrict that kind of creeping gentrification through this this warehouse living well can i try, can I try and deal with your first and third points together because i think they're quite closely um Interrelated. I think in terms of the uniqueness, I think as far as we, you know, the Harringay Harringay Warehouse District, you know, appears on maps of London. It will appear, it'll throw up on on Google Maps. It is an area that has just, that has grown since really about the early 90s, and has become an area where there has been settled occupation, where people are living and working, and that's grown over a time when live work has disappeared really from much of the London scene. And the reason that live work disappeared is that it was perceived as, as open to abuse. So a, a live work scheme would be occupied by people who would then just live there uh, and then would claim that it was a C3 use and that by a residential consent had been secured you know, somewhat, by, um, so, so, somewhat by default. Um, in this case, we, we have taken absolutely the contrary view because the attempt by, uh, by the, the council, I think the council's pol planning policy direction for a long time was to try and make this a residential area. And I think as, a, as owners and operators, we've we've resisted that. We wanted to keep live work going and have defended live work through actually through, you know, enforcement attempts and, and an appeal. So that I don't I think we can say, you know, we are absolutely committed to to warehouse living as a form of live work across across the area. I, I would um, differentiate that quite strongly from Hackney Wick, where I think there are elements of that in, in Hackney Wick amidst a lot of other things going on there, some normal uh, residential use, some normal industrial areas. That area then got a big push because of the Olympics and started to shift. There was disparate ownerships. And, and frankly, at the first opportunity to do so, individual landowners rather cashed in on the huge um, increase in infrastructure capacity in the wider area. Um, that's absolutely not here. There is a there is a one estate which has been managed and uh, is being protected for, um, for, for, for for live work purposes. That's the reason we're here with this application and why we're not bringing you either an office scheme or, or a straightforward residential scheme. So I'd also, you know, uh, I would counter any charge of creeping gentrification because if we were interested in gentrification, we wouldn't be continuing to pursue um, live work uses. Uh, in terms of its its affordability, that the whole re race on debt up there is it is affordable. We've kept it affordable, so you can live, uh, and you have a generous workspaces, and have been able to do that by and large um, at, at a price that's made it accessible to young people who otherwise would not be able to live somewhere in London, and 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 secure a separate a, a separate workspace. 
the issue which we touched on on site about the intermediate landlords. Certainly in the early days, as we uh, acquired some large buildings, that simply we hadn't got the capacity or the resources to convert those, those buildings and to let them. And so people who had become part of the warehouse district would take perhaps a floor or perhaps a building. They would invest money in, in converting that for live work purposes and then people would pay rent then. And, and the area has grown on that, that basis. Different landlords or sub landlords for us in different buildings have gone about things in a different way. And, and in retrospect, some, you know, some rather better than others. Um, and the rents have varied partly according to the, the rate of take up of spaces and partly according to the amount of investment that was required in an individual building. What we've been doing and what we've been talking about through the, the framework document is taking back more central control of that. Um, we don't want to I don't want to be abusive of the those intermediate um, landlords because many of them have actively assisted the development of this area. But I think we're moving now into much more of a regulated framework where we have to be clear there is a, a landlord responsibility and an overall planning responsibility and regulatory uh, responsibility of having to pick up all the issues you would expect of, of occupied buildings about fire safety, um, uh, environmental health standards and so on. Uh, and so we're seeking to do that. We are, uh, I think, will, however, conti continue now to see some spectrum of charging across the area. So some of those older buildings which converted some time ago, we we will keep them. We will keep them affordable because they're, they're, they're very affordable because they are a way into this area. And what will tend to happen is that people will have the option to move into other buildings along the way. Building new at this stage is going to be more expensive for us than has been the case in adapting other buildings. But you know there are. There are people in the area who, um, who make a success of their business, but want to carry on living in a, in a communal environment. Um, and I think that I think that is beneficial to the area. Um, and it also means that we will have some flexibility, I think, to to offer some incentives. I think possibly, as you were talking about, to make sure that we keep a flow of local people coming in here. Obviously, it's not affordable housing in a conventional sense. It's not not housing. I suspect. I mean, we would have no objection whatsoever for you know people having to be on the council's waiting list and want to live workspace to to come in here. But we recognise, by and large, that is not what that's not what we're offering, and it doesn't meet the the kind of demand that grows out out of your housing waiting list. But if we can find some way to target part of it for local people in a more directive way than we currently do, we're very open to that. But I really would reject the charge that we are seeking creeping gentrification. We're absolutely doing the opposite by coming forward with warehouse living applications and not coming forward with residential applications. And just on the cycle lane, yeah, I mean, we're obviously cycling is the main stay of movement in the area. Um, but one or two people may want to say something about it. We are, we don't believe we recognize some people have to use vehicles, part of their work and part of the way they live. We don't really think we should be providing car parks in this area. We're absolutely all for bikes. And to the extent that we can make a contribution to improve cycle infrastructure in the area, yes, of course. As we start to the item before 10 o'clock, we will con we can con do we need to suspend standing? If I may, Chair, it's just Fiona Clark to the committee. So we can, at the Chair's discretion, we can finish the item we've started. Um, but if we wanted to have a large discussion on the two noting items, you could suspend standing orders if you want to continue. Um, but I'm, we normally take issues with questions after committee if, if needed. So uh, uh, m my discretion will keep on just with this discussion. But if you can, it is 10 o'clock. So can you keep your questions and answers short and I'm not looking at anybody in particular uh, but Councillor Corley Harrison yeah two quick points <laughs> two quick points first on the technical to officers um there's reference I mean it's a 10-story building it is just it's a 10-story building regardless of the whole leveling and the fact that they're saying that it's six compared to others or sight lines or whatever we judge it as a 10-story building so it's a tall building yeah 
yeah, I'm getting nods. Second is uh, a comment, not necessarily for response. And I sympathize with trying to recreate something afresh that's supposed to be, you know, a conversion or whatever. Um, but this is supposed to be a landmark building. And my concern is from the viewpoint from Seven Sisters Road, that side aspect of the of the landmark building with the pothole, uh, <laughs> the round windows, porthole windows. Um, it's for me too close to NCP car park style oh. brutalism rather than good brutalism. Um, sorry. And so um, I think I'm aligned with QRP in that I would like to see something a little bit more artistic, um, quite possibly with that. That's a comment. Yeah, okay. don't need to come back and defend or we'll, anything like that. We'll it's your note, design. <laughs> we'll note, please just note the comment about the NCP car park. Um, and I, I, so, <laughs> right, OK, so Councillor Buxton. Uh, Councillor White asked my question, doesn't matter. Great, thank you. So, Councillor Dunson. Yeah, thank you. Just on the on the room sizes, um, I'm, uh, you, the HMO plus. But these are still very small rooms, even if you raise the raise the bed. Um, and yeah, I just I I wonder what if anything we can do, potentially do fewer people um, and, and make the make the bedroom space bigger. I know that they're container units or whatever but um these are these are small rooms in my opinion i mean i, I, I mean we've um i don't i'm not sure about that i mean people um people live very comfortable in these and actually people people live people have choices where they live, live here for quite long times i think the um i i guess the issue is is this issue about height and volume and actually, a kind of a standard feature of many of the rooms is that people put a platform bed in and underneath they have a workspace or they have a desk and it's storage or whatever. So they make greater use of it. And I think there is something, there's something about the volumes of spaces that people really respond to. You, you would, they're not spaces you would ever get in a new built flat or a new built house. Um, uh, so they're much more generous. And also now, as we, you know, as we're in our new adaptations and certainly our new schemes, it's big windows, lots of light. I think, in a way, what you're really buying into is the, your room is a, is a private space, but it should be comfortable and it should be commodious. But it's really it's the big volumes of shared space that that all of this runs on, and it's that it's that communal living. It's not. It really isn't. It really isn't the way people live that you spend. You know, you're not a student. You're not spending your time stuck in a study bedroom. These are not study bedrooms. These are these are you know places where you. You sleep and you have some, you have privacy, but you you are living in a and working in a in a shared space. The focus is on that. We could make, and we've been through this exercise in the framework. You could make the rooms bigger and the shared spaces smaller. Um, and we've tried to strike a balance. And I think you know, so all of us and the officers have been said at the beginning. Really commend the officers, but really uh, part of that whole discussion about getting the balance right. I, I'd also just say for what it's worth, we won't do the same thing. In our next building or the one after we will we will adapt from site to site and and play around with this in the way that we played around with the existing buildings they are minimum i mean they they're all demandable so the, you know the idea is that you, know, you can break it you can break them into bigger rooms oh you can break them into bigger rooms or you can you know that that's the whole thing that it's we have to specify an hmo baseline an hmo plus we've gone beyond that but the way we've de designed it is that you could have two rooms or you could have one and a half. You know, they are multiple mix and that's really where we are. But we have to make sure that there is a baseline standard and that baseline standard is above that of an HMO. So that's where we've gone from and, and also taking a lot from the existing warehouses and bigger than um, London plan standards as well. Do, do, and the, just the only thing on that is this, this just back to this issue about affordability. Yeah. We only have a small number, of, you know, relatively small number of rooms for a, for a given space. You could put more rooms in there, but but then we we wouldn't be a we wouldn't be a live work scheme. We wouldn't be a warehouse scheme, and so that you know that whole structure around making it making it affordable, but making it generous, and making it conducive to communal living, you know, is a balance that we're we're trying to achieve. So. Okay, thank you. So, Councillor Bevan. 
Well, in the past, my understanding is live work units haven't worked in Harringay because when the business rates are properly allocated, people can't actually afford them. But I might be out of date on that. I noticed this report has quite critical comments from the design review panel. That I think they're expressing quite concern. They talk about the internal units, and I note the bedroom sizes are really small. But my main concern is this is a gateway site. I am the design champion for Harringay. You have shown three pictures on that screen on a really prominent location on the entrance to Harringay that, in my opinion, the general public would be appalled if they had to drive past and look at that every single day. So I think you really need to, need to go away and totally reconsider your design because the attractiveness of that scheme is, in my opinion, at this present time, unacceptable. OK, all right. No, I, I just want you... Yeah, I just want you to know, because there weren't questions in that, there were um, comments for noting. So, um, Councillor Worrell. Hi. Um, I, I think we might have touched on this a little bit during the site visit, but, and apologies if this has been covered somewhere in the report or the presentation, it's been a long night, so my, concentra my concentration could have lapsed for a moment. Um, but in terms of, like, you know, trying to sort of create artificial well, not artificial, but like new warehouse living out of things which are not industrial buildings, 